Hello, everybody, and welcome along to our sound and vision coverage of the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship as we've come up to beautiful Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, right in the heart of dairy country, and to the formidable challenge that is the four miles of Road America, the longest track on our IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship schedule for a two hour and 40 minute dash through this green and pleasant countryside. Just about an hour or so north of Milwaukee, Road America has looked the same for a very long time now with 14 corners populating that four mile lap and it's set challenges down through the years for some of the world's best teams, car manufacturers and drivers. It'll be no different today. The long run over the start finish line to turn one. Opportunities to make up some early positions there on the first lap, but also an opportunity for your race to go very sour very quickly. A downhill braking area to the left hand at turn five before going up through six. The quick turn seven. Hurry downs into turn eight, the left-hander, then the long carousel, then the intimidating run through the concrete canyon of the kink all the way down to Canada Corner at turn 12. And from there, it's all back uphill again to the start-finish line. This is a lap that is made for heroes. And this weekend, we've already seen qualifying performances that have been off the scale. More lap records set again this year. Now 57 new records set in this IMSA 50th anniversary season. And this one is really significant. The Acura DPI number six of the Acura team Penske with Dan Cameron on board, faster in qualifying than any prototype that we have seen here in IMSA competition since qualifying in 2008. That was Lucas Lur, and he was in a thousand horsepower Audi with the ability to pump up the boost. The lap time that Dane set was quicker even than Mark Werner went in a similar car in the race. Only by eight one thousandth of a second, but quicker nevertheless for well over 134 mile an hour average. For anyone who thinks the DPIs on proper racing cars, well, they've come of age this year in the IMSA 50th anniversary, this golden season, and we have got great competition at the front of the field. Mazda are on a two-race winning streak. Acura have been their major competition, and they will want to break that streak this weekend just as much as the guys in the dark soul crystal red cars will want to keep it going. Jeremy Shaw, there are battles aplenty, not just at the front of the field, but right throughout the classes. And the big news is a Corvette starts on pole position in GTLM ahead of a couple of Fords and a Porsche with the two fast BMWs relegated to the back after an infraction in qualifying. Yeah, for Corvette racing, they really need, need a win. It's been way too long since they've been in the uh, in victory lane here. They're still seeking that 200th, uh, excuse me, the 100th win in North America. Maybe it'll come this afternoon. That's certainly what the team is planning. Oliver, Oliver Gavin and Tommy Milner back at the wheel of number four car alongside Oliver, having having missed the last two races due to a, uh, sustaining a broken hand in a crash at Watkins Glen. So welcome back to Tommy. There'd be no better way to get back uh, than to win the race. But for Jan Magnussen, Magnussen and uh, Antonio Garcia, they were right up in championship contention until having a couple of relatively poor last two outings. So they want to get themselves back up into that points challenging position. Uh, and Tommy Milner is still uh, driving with a, a cast, but it's, it's more of a support, a soft cast, if you will, uh, than what I would call a pot, an old-fashioned chalk, as we're used to call them, back in the UK. In GT Daytona, Ben Keating's claimed his first pole position after a string of second-place qualifying, and that car has been super impressive all the way through the weekend and absolutely great news that uh, Ben is on pole position for him and Jerome Blinkermolen, but he's got plenty of people snapping at his heels as well. Oh man, it's, all, it's all, all so tight in GTD, always is, and certainly with the, uh, the small balance of performance changes for, for a few cars coming into this weekend, the biggest change certainly was to the McLaren, which is only uh, in its fourth North American race, that gorgeous 720S GT3 car, and uh, that car's got a bit uh, more horsepower, it's got a bit, little bit less weight, and Matt Pl Plum did a super job in qualifying to put that car third on the grid. GTLM, and that's going to be a battle. The uh, 
BMWs are fast here, but they've got to start from the back and they've got to work their way through. Good little battle in LMP2 as well, Jeremy. Just the two Oricas there, um, but they've been close right through this weekend too. Yeah, and Matt McMurray in particular was super fast in qualifying. Unfortunately, that uh, time was taken away from him because he, he went off the road and caused a red flag. Uh, he, uh, so he has to start, uh, well, had to, supposed to start second in the class, but both uh, the PR1 Matheson Motorsports, that is car number 52, and the Performance Tech Motorsports, car number 38. They've both changed their starting drivers for the race. Uh, so it would be the guys who didn't take the qualifying duties yesterday who will start. Uh, but because the number 38 team made that decision before the number 52, that will mean the number 38 car will start uh, ahead of the number 52 in this race. Before we get underway here, member of our motorsport and endurance racing community no longer with us as of this morning with the sad news that Jean-Paul Drio, the founder and man at the top of the dam's motor racing concern, uh, has died having fought bravely against a short illness, uh, taking his life at 68 years old. His wife and his two sons, of course, get all of our condolences. Dam's a team that is synonymous with motor racing, particularly in France, dominated the international 3,000 ranks a few years ago and have stayed in those open wheel categories with a win and a third place over in the Grand Prix at Hungary this weekend, being dedicated to their founder, but also dabbled in endurance racing as well. For anybody who knew Jean-Paul, they knew he was a total enthusiast. He had the heart of a lion and much passion. Always worth having a sit and a chat with him if you bumped into him anywhere, like this black coffee as well. And if you could sit down and combine all of those, it was never time wasted. Jean-Paul Trio, the man at the head of the Dams Motor Racing Concern, who died today at 68 years old. Tell you what, JPD would have loved this today. What's going on at the front of the field, Jeremy? Because we have a battle royale about to get underway. Two hours and 40 minutes, it's one of those tricky distances as far as time's concerned as well. It doesn't directly correlate with a full set of stops. No, that's right, and this pit strategy is certainly going to be really important to hear. But anyway, let me just clarify in LMP2, we've got that the wrong way around. It's number 52 team that made the decision to change starting drivers before the number 38. So it'll be Patrick Kelly who starts on the pole position. Patrick's originally from Minnesota, he lives now in Los Angeles, but uh, he's making his comeback to racing after almost 10 years away. And he's done a very good job indeed. The safety car is in the pit lane, field under the direction now of Dane Cameron, who hits the right-hand pedal and stretches the field and stretches the two Acuras as they head over the top of the rise, across the line, down towards the first corner. Here come the Masters, 77 and 55, and now side by side. Are they going to get themselves into trouble at turn one? No, they don't, but coming right the way around the outside, the number 10 of Renga van der Zander doing a cracking job making up pos positions earlier on. He's almost side by side with the number 84, which was has dropped back a little bit, that's Simon Trummer who didn't get the greatest of starts in GT Le Mans. Corvette, Ford and Porsche battling out at the front of the field, but the two Acuras with gap, a gap between them, a safe gap between them. Then the two masters side by side into turn five, 77. Oli Jarvis holds on to his third position. Then the Action Express wheel and engineering car, the number 31 red and white car. First of the JDC Miller cars has got the five Mustang sampling car right in alongside. No, it's not. It's the 10 still making up positions. Renga van der Zander is rocket propelled in this first half lap. Changed a brand new set of Michelin tires on that car and he's taking full advantage of them in the early stages of this race. Brilliant effort by Renga van der Zander there. Uh, the start was, was pretty clean, but Oliver Jarvis got kind of pinched up against the pit wall by Elio Castro and Evers had to just ease off the throttle just a little bit, not allowed to Jonathan Bonbury to get a run on him, and then going down the back straight, Bonbury makes the move into turn five, so the Mazers have changed position, but in GTLM, well, it's super tight, but it's the Ford now in the lead at the moment. 
through they go into the kick for the first time. No, it's still the Corvette. No, the yeah, the Corvette of Ollie Gavin's got a bit of breathing space. You weren't expecting that. I don't think we were, right? Yeah. Briscoe, who could have been on pole position, had a chat with the Alpha Bolozzi earlier on. Inevitably, we were talking about Ashes cricket uh, in very, actually, affable terms, to be honest. We uh, had a good chat about the cricket, but he was uh, rather ruining the fact that his fastest lap was taken away for a track limit infraction. That would have put him on pole position. He says he's never been so excited to drive a car in qualifying because this place is so quick and it suits the Ford. Really looked confident for the race. The light blue and light red stripes on that car. Heritage livery, second position then in that class. If we go back to GTD, Paul Sitter, Ben Keating, Holding on from the Lamborghini Huracan of Corey Lewis in second place, side by side, Bill Oberlin. Down the outside of the Lexus, the blue and yellow BMW, the yellow and black number 14, is Robbie Highstand, who is in the Lexus RCF GT3. Bill Oberlin going for a remarkable run of victories and would become the most successful IMSA driver on victories if he can get a class win today would go ahead of Scott Pruitt in the standings. Equal. Would he, oh, would he equal him? I I'm sorry. So, yeah, yeah so. my apologies. I think so. So he would become the joint most successful yeah. driver with Scott Pruitt. And on that first lap, Oliver Jarvis did maintain his third position, by the way, ahead of Jonathan Bomrito. So no change in the starting positions on the first lap at the front of the DPI field. But the big mover, though, was uh, Renga van der Zander up from 10th to 6th on that first lap. And he had to do that if he was going to make the best of the new Michelin tyres. It was a gamble to go to the back, but he's now still further up than where he would have qualified, so that's a gamble maybe that paid off. Oli Jarvis about to put the fastest lap of the race in as we wait for the two Acuras to come across. There's Jarvis in the dark, red, Mazda with the lighter roof, that's how you tell those two apart. They go across the start finish line now, and it was indeed the fastest lap of the race for his teammate. 152.8. Ollie Jarvis on an absolute tear, but his teammate super quick in the final sector, and that's where Bomarito found the time. Six tenths of a second between Ollie Jarvis and the two Acuras up front. Meanwhile, in GT Daytona, the battles rage on down towards the middle of and the back end of the top 10 with Patrick Lindsay in 12th position at the moment in the Porsche number 73 that's the dark grey white and red striped car in behind the second of the Lexus Frankie Monkey Calvo in the number 12 car he's right up behind 10th position Cooper McNeil the WeatherTech sponsored car WeatherTech local company to Rhoda Maringa and have a huge amount of corporate guests here this weekend. 600 employees being brought to the track today. I think they were all in the pit walk earlier on, to be honest. It's their 30th anniversary of operation for WeatherTech. A very, very proud American and local company to Road America. So early exchanges now having been completed and everybody sitting in the same direction, still is pointing in the right direction. So that's good news to start with as well, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, it is in stark contrast to quite a few other races we've had this it weekend, but there's been early incidents. Top four cars, even top five cars actually, still pretty close together. Uh, at the front of the field and again we talked about it. you want to make sure that the, you don't sort of overextend the, the tyres too soon in their life cycle but well, that was a new fastest lap there for our race leader 152.734 that is a new race lap record here for IMSA competition that eclipses the 152.8 that was set last year by Simon Trummer it's Dane Cameron that has set the new standard all right okay so it's gone from Mazda back to Acura. At IMSA Radio, by the way, if you want to get in touch with us, as the leaders track uphill towards turn five and turn six, excuse me, and go through it. 
Turn seven now, barely a lift, a little bit extra curb on the inside, a little bit of concrete beyond the red and yellow curbing. Great battle going on in GT Le Mans at turn three at the moment at the bottom of the hill on the far side of the track from us. It's the battle for third position with Lawrence Van Ter having the rest of the field line astern. The Corvette has broken away. Oli Gavin has made his bid for freedom and has two and a half seconds on the Ford GT of Ryan Briscoe, who's then got another couple of seconds on the battle for third. And effectively, everybody else in the race is battling for third position. So third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth being third Van Tour in the Porsche, then Magnussen in the number three Corvette, then the two BMWs, Blomqvist in the 25, Kron in the 24, and just a little bit off the back of that, but still in touch, Patrick Peele in the number nine of one one Porsche. Second in the championship for drivers. Big day today for Porsche. They get the right result. They could clinch the Manufacturers' Championship in GT Le Mans. And in our mission on Countdown to Green, Lawrence Vanto and Earl Bamba saying they really hope they can do that because they want to be cut loose to go after the Drivers' Championship against their teammates, which could get very expensive for Porsche GT Racing. Coming down to the two and a half hour Mark already, my goodness, the first 10 minutes have <laughs> gone over very quickly indeed, Jeremy. Dean Cameron just holding on to about seven tenths of a lead from his teammate, but Oli Jarvis keeping the two Acura's in sight at the head of the field. Very much so, and in fact, it was Jarvis who set the fastest lap on that last time around again, so resetting the lap record there, 152.577 for that number 77 Mazda in third position. Seven different manufacturers in the top seven of GTD as well, Jeremy, at the moment, being Mercedes AMG, Lamborghini, Porsche, McLaren, Lexus, BMW, Acura. First repeat is the second Acura, the number 86 car. Trent Hinman behind Bear Figueredo, his teammate. Top 10 made up with the 91 Porsche, Anthony Imperato and Cooper McNeil in the WeatherTech. Ferrari number 63, still though Ben Keating leading there by an increasing margin, 1.22 seconds. Yeah, he's doing a super job, but uh, pretty much everybody else has nose to tail there in GTD. It is uh, interesting to see, he's still early in the race, obviously, we're only completed four laps, but still there's no, no separation at all in the GTD category. And it's the same up front too, the, the Acuras and the Mazdas. I mean, they, they are, uh, haven't pulled away at this stage in the race from the Cadillac Horde. Set nip down to share Adam in the pit lane. Awfully quiet for you at this time of the race. Everybody got away fine, and presumably the team's just watching the race develop. Yeah, not even seeing tires being readied uh, for when the first pit stop will happen. Of course, if a yellow comes out within the first 15 minutes of a race, it's called a quick yellow, so the pits do not open. So as it is right now, just sort of standing here watching the crews, watching the TV screens and seeing the body language, but um, watching how quickly those prototypes are coming up on the back of the GTD field, I don't think it's going to be much longer before they're into traffic. Yeah, well, that's true. It's a long lap here, so you do get a little more grace than perhaps at some of the other circuits. I think, you know, the top, what, six cars, Jeremy, yep. are just starting to come back together again because people Durrani in the red and white wheel and Cadillac uh, and then Renga van der Zander, who, remember, started on brand new Michelins. Everyone else has started the race on the Michelin tyres that they qualified on, which means they've got between half a dozen and eight laps, maybe 10 at the outside on them. So Renga van der Zander's pace, with now five laps completed, has, he's had the benefit, he's had the performance advantage, if you will, from those brand new tyres. But these top six now, pulling away from the rest of the field behind Renga, back to Simon Trimmer, there's four seconds between himself and the first of the JDC Miller Motorsports car. But I'm impressed with these two Cadillacs, Jeremy. Yeah. One from Action Express and one from Konica Minolta Racing hanging on to the Japanese manufacturers at the front of the field. Very definitely. And the interesting thing there also is the fact that uh, Simon Trummer in that caliber 85, he's slipping back now at a pretty, pretty substantial rate from that top six. He lost last time around more than a second uh, to the leading sextet that are definitely pulling away. So, 
leaders have gone through into turn one. No great changes there, but don't think that that means that the guys are just having a gentle Sunday afternoon drive. Far from it, they're absolutely on the ragged edge at the moment, and the lap times prove that as Dan Cameron goes even quicker last time around. 152.6, not quite as fast as the fastest lap of the race. Ollie Jarvis set that a couple of laps ago in the Mazda. That fast lap bouncing between the guys competing at the front of the field. They're driving each other on here, Jeremy, and the GT battles are just as intense. Bottom of the top 10, WeatherTech 63 car, Cooper McNeil at in, in the 10th position ahead of him. Anthony Imperato in the 91 Porsche as they come out to turn three. Then the two MSR NSXs. And there's now been a change there because Trent Hinman's got past Bea Figueredo, his teammate. So the Caterpillar car's gone back one position. Trent Hinman better off in the championship there. And that's just happened on this lap because as they went across the line, I'm pretty sure Bea was still ahead of him in yep. the black and yellow Caterpillar sponsored car. Just in behind Cooper Nick Nick McNeil, by the way, Frankie Monte Calvo is not too far back, and Patrick Lindsay in the Porsche is a lot closer than the 1.1 seconds he was last time around. So this little battle, which is effectively from seventh place down to about 12th place, yes, indeed 12th position in GT Daytona, just beginning to get turned up to gas mark six. There are battles all the way through this field. Even in LMP2, there might only be two cars, but it only takes two cars to make a race, doesn't it? And Patrick Kelly now is coming under increasing pressure from Cameron Castles. The Canadian driver in that kind of a 38, the Sentinel Spine Performance Tech Motorsports entry. Cameron's already had a great day because he scored his first victory in the AM class with the Lamborghini Super Trofeo earlier on today against some very talented youngsters. Yes, the two youngsters had a spin uh, and dropped some ground, but Cameron was ahead of them at the time of that incident. So it was a very, very well-earned victory. So his confidence right now is sky high. Uh, hello to Steve Tadman, who is tuned in. Not sure where you are around the world, Steve, but good to have your company. He's tweeted in at Ipsa really. He says, on GT Daytona, similar inspector GT3. They are actually GT3, Steve. That's a, a good question. They use the GT3 homologated cars. Uh, IMSA are allowed to make changes to the balance of the performance of those cars as they see fit. And if they do that, they are using a huge amount of data to make those calculations. Seven different manufacturers in the top seven would suggest that they've got their sums right. And if you've been watching IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship this year, you'll know that is not an uncommon event to see all the manufacturers in with a chance. And I, I think all bar one of the manufacturers have been on the podium this year, which rather underlines that. Traffic now coming into play. Shea Adams said it might. Our Porsche keys to the race. Track position, little bit of patience. Watch your tyres. That left front in particular that you lean on there. Do want to burn that one up early. And the Cadillacs may have a little advantage through traffic. They've got such big engines and so much torque. They might be able to use that to close the gap between themselves and the four smaller engine cars. Remember, the two Mazdas are only four-cylinder, two-litre turbocharged engines ahead of them. They take a wee while to spin up, although AER, the guys who look after the Mazda engines, have been doing a lot of work recently and have had improvements in power, better fuel mileage, and more reliable. That's uh, almost normally unattainable all three of those, that virtuous triangle, but somehow that's come together. And that's brought the Masters closer to the back of Elio Castro Neves, who hasn't had the best of the traffic. His teammate, Dame Cameron's pulled away, but second, third and fourth in the overall now. Coming up to the back of the McLaren 720S, great to see that car in the GT Daytona ranks. Through turn five, climbing the hill. Looks like Castro Neves will get through, does get past the number 76 car been driven since the start of the race, that Cutlass car by Paul Holton, I think it was, who started it, was it? No, it was Matt Plum, excuse me. Thank you, Jeremy. And that is the fourth-placed car in GTD. So they're working their way towards the front of the GT Daytona field, which means there are battles going on here. And there's a great battle going on for first and second as Corey Lewis has caught Ben Keating while the leaders are coming through. 
Ollie Jarvis has got to get past them both as they head to the kink. He's got his teammate right in behind. They won't get by before the kink. Can they sweep by after? Yes, they can. This is all getting very tight to do. The two Cadillacs behind absolutely as one. Trying to go around the outside of Corey Lewis down into Canada corner. They'll have the inside run. Made that happen, but just about. Ben Keating ahead of them now. And Pivo Durrani in the red and white Cadillac will dive to the left where the Bill Mitchell Bridge used to be. Now into turn 14 and climbing the hill. Two hours, 23 minutes to go. Here's our Cadillac in race update. Acura's first and second, separated by 2.2 seconds. Dean Cameron in the six from Elio Castro Nevis in the seven. Three seconds further back now after that run through the traffic. Ollie Jarvis in the 77 and his teammate Jonathan Bomarito in the 55 Masters. Best of the Cadillacs, Peter Durrani. He's another two seconds further back in the red and white wheel at number 31. Renga van der Zander for close company makes up the top six in that glossy black number 10. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly leads Cameron Castles, but by the blink of an eye, half a second in 10th and 11th position for those two Oregas. Ollie Gavin from Paul, remember, by 2.7 seconds, the Ford Corvette leading the 67 Ford. That's the bright yellow Corvette from the light blue Ford. Then the mostly white Porsche number 912 of Lawrence Van Tour. And what a good job Dane Cameron did to work his way through that traffic. Uh, he was absolutely incisive in his moves. He's all of a sudden got two seconds over his teammate, Elio Castroneves, and the two Acuras are now uh, three seconds ahead of the best of the Masters. In GT Daytona, Ben Keating for Mercedes and the 33 Riley crew by just three quarters of a second from Corey Lewis in the 48 Paul Miller racing Lamborghini Huracan. Then the first of the Porsches is Zach Robichon in the number nine. That's the plaid Porsche from Faf. Easy to remember that one. And Matt Plum in that orange and dark grey. Number 76 McLaren ahead of the Lexus. Number 14, Robbie Heistan. Then, then uh, Robbie Foley in the BMW M6. Number 96. That is the Bill Oberlin. The car he shares with Bill Oberlin, who's looking for that record tying win today. That's your Cadillac in race update. Cadillac V Series, because real races never take time off. Shea Adam is down in the pit lane. It would be early for a pit stop now, Shea, but people start to get ready early, just in case any signs of movement. Only two drivers on the entire pit lane have their helmets on right now. They are Nick Tandy from the number 911 Porsche and Tristan Nunez for the 77 Mazda. Mm, I wonder if that's just precautionary. I think you'll have to peel Ollie Jarvis out of there. I think you may have to threaten him to get him out, to be honest. He's having such a good run of it at the moment. Still the battle for third position in GT Le Mans. These are equivalent to the GTE cars you'll see running at Le Mans. And indeed, the 66 car in fourth position at the moment, running the red, white, and blue with the Le Mans winning Ford from 2016. Great battle going on here behind the 912 of Lawrence Van Tour. Yeah, who's slipping back from the first two here. That gap is, uh, is increasing lap by lap now. Uh, between the number 67 of Ryan Briscoe, who's actually edging a little bit closer, a little bit closer to the race leading Oliver Gavin Corvette. But Lawrence Vanto are definitely slipping back uh, by at the rate of, well, half a second or so or more a lap, and that's significant. And he's holding up now that train behind Dirk Mueller, Jan Magnussen, two BMWs in there. Patrick Pilitz, he's still off the tail end of just a little bit by a couple of seconds, but uh, by, by, by doing so, he'll be saving a little bit of fuel as well. Also interesting in LMP2, change of leadership on that last lap, number 38 car of Cameron Castles has got past the debutant Patrick Kelly. 20 minutes into the race, and we're starting to see more interest taken down in the pit lane. This will be a very, very early stop with still two hours and 20 minutes to go. If anyone was to come in now without an issue, that would be an interesting strategic manoeuvre. But in comes Patrick Pele. Pele is in, so maybe there's a problem with... I wonder if they've used up their tyres too much in qualifying 
Nick Tandy is on the wall, and Shea Adam is down at the Porsche GT team. It's a very long, slow rumble down the pit lane as Patrick Pinglin brings his number 911 Porsche in. It's a different crew doing the tire change this weekend, too, because their car chief, Adam, welcomed his first son into the world. Baby Luca has made it, so it means that they've had to do a bit of shuffling because Adam is also the front tire changer, so we'll watch carefully to make sure that all four Michelin tires go on properly. They've already done the left side. Door is still open as Patrick is belting in Nick. He closes the door. This is the winning duo from 2015 in the GTLM race. Field probe comes out, and 911 is sent. So, take me through that again. That was tires? Tires, fuel, the driver change. Top, a little top up of fuel, because he wouldn't have used that much. Well, I, I, think they're, well, I think they're probably going to go for that three-stop strategy. He's going to try and get out now on a fresh set of Michelin tires, turn some hot laps, and maybe maybe make some progress. But uh, what enabled the number 67 car to do that, the, the uh, Ford GT two weeks ago at Lyman, was the fact that he was right up on the tail of the yeah. other cars before he made that first pit stop. Uh, Patrick Pino, he was already a couple of seconds behind, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult. They got burned by sticking to their two-stop strategy at Lime Rock Park. They didn't react quick enough when, other, when they saw other people around them doing it, and there's been a reaction on the pit wall. Shea Adam. Number three, Corvette Racing. They sit third in the championship behind the number two in the championship duo of 911 that we just saw do the pit stop. Antonio Garcia, the king of Spain, never won here in Road America, yet is up on the wall with four new Michelin tires. Well, teams have got two cars that can afford to split the strategy. Porsche keys to the race, left front tire. Remember, you've got to execute your pit stop well, though, as the two Cadillacs head down towards turn one. Battling for fourth and fifth position at the moment under the Briggs and Stratton side and down through the little kink at two into turn three. People Durrani versus Renga van der Zander. That's a battle that's mouth-watering. Couple of notes here on prototypes. Number 85 car must have had a spin a couple of laps ago. Misha Goitberg, he's dropped to the tail of the uh, DPI field. Also on this last lap, number 55 car, Jonathan Bomarito has gone ahead of Oliver Jarvis by quite some margin. Don't know what happened there, but all of a sudden, Jarvis lost three seconds on that last lap. It, and happened, now... it happened on the straight, Jeremy. So into turn one, it happened oh, it? after the start-finish line. Uh, and given that there was a bit of movement down at Ollie Jarvis's pit, I wonder if that was planned. If Ollie's coming in, he won't want to hold up Jonathan Bomarito if he's on a different strategy. Let's see what happens at the end of this lap. The two Acuras now have a five-second gap to the first of the Mazdas, which is Jonathan Bomarito now in the 55 car. And as they head down the into Canada Corner area, they're actually into Canada Corner before Bomarito comes around that last little left-hand corner. So that is a decent run. Now, the, the next question for me is whether the Acuras, if someone jumps, they'll split their strategy as well. They're not coming in this time around. We've had 25 minutes of racing. Probably another five or ten minutes, which is round about three or four laps. Five at the outside, I would think, before we see any of the prototypes coming in who are going all the way through to the end of their run. Patrick Kelly has had a warning from race control after having a contra tom with the car number eight, that being the Audi of Parker Chase. I did see that car, oh, off! Hugh Plum in the McLaren coming through the kick. He's had a wild moment there and dropped back a couple of positions as John Bennett's come into the pit lane and so has Jan Magnussen. Magnussen in the pit lane from GT Le Mans in the number three Corvette. Driver change in four tires for the core Autosport Nissan DPI. Remember, they were the driver duo who were winning last year. But for the number three Corvette, Jan Magnussen out and Antonio Garcia getting in. They're doing fuel and four tires, a staggered stop. They do the right front and the left rear last. Air gun comes out, fuel probe is still attached. Car has not yet fired back up, fuel probe comes out. And Antonio stalls in, trying to leave, regains composure, and leaves us with the beautiful sound of a Corvette engine. Yeah, and the, and the reason for that, I think, is that I'm sure Corvette Racing felt that the 
that the number three car was being held up by that other trainer car, specifically number 912 Porsche. So bring him in now, get him on fresh tyres, and try and jump that lot, get ahead and turn some fast laps on this fresh set oh. of Michelin tyres. Oh, no. Problem from Ben Keating. Left rear wheel all askew and rubbing the bodywork, but I think it's worse than that. If it isn't coming off, he's got suspension damage. Now, has there been a collision there? Matt Plum going off a, a moment or two ago. He was right up behind the number 52 Oregon. I just wonder if it took the air off the front of the car. Even the GTD cars, the GT3 cars, need their air all to work. Down to turn five for Bernie Sting. Well out the way. He's got a long way to go. As in from the front of the field in second position, Ariel Castro Neves may be anticipating a full course yellow. Well, you know the boss on the box for the number seven is Mr. Tim Sidrick, and you never doubt Tim's strategy. It is a four-tire stop for Elio. He is not getting out of the car yet. He's getting a new drinks bottle. As also in is the number 31, who is the Whalen Engineering Cadillac. Much improved pit stop from last year for the Whalen Engineering Cadillac, given that the rear of their car is not damaged, and it was last year missing a cheese wedge. We wait for Elio to get the clearance to leave. Fuel probe still attached. He gets a quick clean to the windshield. That's a long time to leave that act. We're rubbing it full chat. And away goes Elio. It is fuel and tires also for Pipo Durrani, who is staying aboard the number 31. And congratulations to Austin Sindrick, who got his first victory this weekend. Nice to see him back in a sports car paddock again. Had lots of fun with him when he was driving GT3s in the Bathurst 12 hours for Erebus Racing. Fine young man and a great racing driver as well. Ben Keating is doing an absolutely extraordinarily good job to try and get this AMG back. He's going at a decent clip with the left rear wheel, desperately trying to steer him into the wall down towards Canada corner. Now, did it happen on its own or did he get some help? Threw into turn one and oh, did he run just a little bit wide there and catch it on the edge of the curb There was Close attention from the second place car, Corey Lewis, but I don't think there was a a rub there, and the prototype that was going through went through on the other side of the car. Only thing I can think of is he's dropped that rear wheel off the end of a curb and it's pulled a suspension arm or even a drive shaft. Easy enough to do. Leader is in the pit lane. New leader now for Jonathan Bomarito. The Mazda's now first and second. We know they get good mileage. Mazda 55 leads it from Renga van der Zander in second because Oli Jarvis has come in. The Acura comes to a halt. Off comes the Michelin tyres with which they qualify. On goes a new set and a new driver as well as Bomarito gets out and Juan Montoya already being bolted into that car. Fuel still going in. This is good. You want to have everything done around the car before the fuel horse come in, come off. There it is, coming off any second now. And he's down and away. Meantime, Shea was watching what was going on at the Keating pit for that stricken Mercedes AMG. It was a beautiful stop for the 77 Mazda. Before I get there, Tristan Nunez gets in the car, four new Michelins and fuel, and he leaves relatively close to the Acura. Now, Keating car is in, the engine is off. They are examining whether or not they can do this work on the pit lane. Nice, thick line around the inside of the Michelin, though, John. This is going to take a while. The two Acuras battling together, remember, the seven car made the stop a lap earlier and therefore has warmer Michelins. They go side by side. They, oh, yes, they do touch. They do touch. My goodness me. That will not go down well on the pit wall down into turn five. And the seven's gone through. Elio Castro Neves on teammate Juan Montoya saw the benefit, <laughs> Jeremy, of doing the tyre swap one lap earlier is a very, very hot set of Michelins and a bit of extra performance, even after a relatively short time, just 25 minutes. In comes the Mazda from the lead. Now, the car that he is racing is in the carousel and out of it right now. Shea Adam is watching the Mazda team your stop. Now, they did have Harry Ticknell getting ready to go, but the question is, does the lanky Englishman jump over the wall to get in the car? 
I believe not yet. They are going to be doing a water bottle change, but no driver change for the Mazda. New tires for Jonathan Bomarito. In behind them is the number 10 Whalen, uh, excuse me, the number 10 Chronic Minolta Cadillac. That is fuel and tires only as well. And in also the two banana boats. Should let you know, John, it's broken left rear suspension on the heating car. They are fixing it on the pit lane. They will send Ben back out. Down and away for the Mazda, where are the Acuas? Here they come, across the line now. This is going to be very tight at the end of the pit lane, but I think the Mazda is going to drop in behind them. Yes, it is. Comes off the pit lane speed limiter now, and already the two Acuas are into the first corner. So the Mazda not able to make going a couple of laps longer than the Acuas pit. In terms of their performance, the drop off at the end of the stint has cost them badly there. At the front of the field of GT Le Mans, Ollie Gavin has been closed down by Ryan Briscoe under the Corvette bridge. The Ford is now less than half a second behind the GT Le Mans leader, the number four bright yellow Corvette. And oftentimes there is a, an advantage by staying out a little bit longer on, on your, on your, your uh, low tank of fuel. And if the tires are still working well, you can make up really, uh, make a, you know, a very fast lap uh, before you make your pit stop and then come out ahead come out uh, ahead of the, of your rival but here the new tires are worth so much that you can get if you come in earlier you can kind of do what this was called the undercut and you can get out and really get on the gas when you get out of the uh, pit lane take advantage of those fresh tires and leapfrog effectively the cars that you had been behind beforehand Ryan Briscoe sizing up Ollie Gavin down towards Canada corner he's going to have to come from a long way back Ollie's pushing hard back into the Corvette snaking around as the middle pedal was pressed there. Corvette may be struggling for a little bit of grip now. Out in front of GTLM, the Ford very, very light on its tyres. Coming out the final corner now, they're about to climb up to the top of the hill. And we'll give you the rundown in a minute or two in our Cadillac in-race update. There goes Ollie Gavin past me now, heading down towards turn one. Fabulous afternoon here, a little bit of high cloud. Some of it is a little bit grey. We did have pop-up thunderstorms yesterday that came out of seemingly nowhere. Across the line then, at the end of 16 laps, Elio Castro Neves leads for Acura from his teammate Juan Montoya. Three quarters of a second, the gap. Then it's five seconds back to the first, the Mazdas. Jonathan Bomarito from Tristan Nunes. So both and, of and the right. drivers changed in the... All of the drivers changed in the top four cars. Yeah, and right with those two now is number 31 Cadillac of Pipo Durrani. He was, along with number seven car, he was the first guy to make a pit stop, and he's uh, certainly taken advantage of that to pull up onto the tail of the two Mazdas. Meanwhile, in GTLM, the number four car, remember that, led by a good couple of seconds, even as much as three. Well, it's now got the 67 Ford right on its tail as they uh, uh, head around. Uh, uh, the interesting thing for me is that Durrani and Van der Zander both stayed in the cars whilst the four cars ahead of them changed their drivers. It's a long old run if those, if Elio, Juan, Jonathan and Tristan are going to do over two hours. They must be thinking about putting the starting driver back in somewhere near the end. I can't yeah. imagine they're going to run them to for two hours. I agree with you. Leaders coming through the battle at the head of GT Le Mans now, through the kink. Both of the Acuras picking their way carefully but decisively past Ollie Gavin, who's eked out a little bit of a lead this time into Canada corner. He's had a good middle section there. Philippe Albuquerque is in the number five Cadillac. That's the Mustang sampling car, seventh position. He's just turned that car's fastest lap of the race. And Colin Brown has taken over from his teammate, the 54 car in Ninth position has the fastest lap of the race for the Core Autosport Nissan. 151-810. That happened on lap 17 last time around. The two Mazdas, probably about where they were, but as Jeremy mentioned, Pete Durrani is trying to close in on them. In GT Le Mans. Oli Gavin and Ryan Briscoe are still seven seconds ahead of the rest of the field, which is still led by Lawrence Van Tour, and none of those leading six cars have stopped. The only two cars that have stopped in GTLM, seventh position number three, Antonio Garcia. That's the Corvette and the Porsche of Nick Tandy, the 911, number 911.
Those two cars stopped, changed driver, tyres and a new tank of fuel, or a full tank of fuel, to take them deeper into the race. Coming down to the two hour and two hour mark, just three minutes away from that now. Jonathan Bomarito puts his and that car's fastest lap of the race in, trying to close down Montoya. And he's taken a couple of seconds out of Montoya last time around. So all of a sudden it's down to four seconds. Uh, three and a half seconds make that between himself and Juan. Through the carousel at the moment is where the battle for GT Le Mans is. Ollie Gavin heads towards the kick with his mirrors full of a very low slung Ford GT. Uncertainty about Ford's continuation in the championship for next year. Rumours been abounding of a DPI programme. But we talked with the founding editor of Sports Car 365, John De Geese, yesterday about an interview he had with Ford's Motorsport Director. There will be no Ford DPI in the current regulations. However, no secret that Ford is very interested indeed in the DPI 2022 regulations with hybrid technology in that set of rules and even more freedom for aerodynamic and styling of the bodywork of the 2022 version of DPI. Expect to hear more from a number of manufacturers on that with the regulations. Scott Atherton committing to the regulations, a full rule set being out and in the hands of all concerned in the first quarter of next year, fully two years before those cars need to come to the track to compete. For the moment, we're very happy with DPI as it stands right now because it's providing great entertainment. Two tenths of a second between Castro Neves and Montoya. Remember, there was a little bit of trading of the Penske paint for Elio Castro Neves to take the lead as Montoya was coming out on his outlap on slightly colder Michelin's. No tyre blankets allowed in IMSA racing, so it does take a little while to get the Michelin's up to temperature and pressure. But there does seem to be a bit of needle going on between those teammates. It does, doesn't it? It was, <laughs> it was pretty uncompromising. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just, he didn't just sneak down the inside, he definitely gave him a hip check as they went down the yeah. hill towards turn five, which... Uh, was, yeah, I'm sure that would have raised a few eyebrows on the uh, on the pit stand at Accurate Penske. Do you think somebody might have been on the radio saying, now, now, fellas, yeah. or words to that effect? The third position coming through the final corner now, having just put a lap on the LMP2, Orica of Patrick Kelly. That's the Mazda picking way through GT Daytona traffic, crosses the line in front of our IMSA broadcast booth. Master of Jonathan Bomarito has now pulled out a second and a half, but Bomarito is flying at the moment, yeah. and he's cut the lead to under three seconds, or the gap rather, to under three seconds between him and the leader, yeah. and to Montoya, less than two seconds now. Yeah, that's right, that gap's come down. It was 5.2 seconds, then 3.5, 2.4, now 1.8 last time around between Montoya in second place and Bomarito in third, and... As you suggest there, uh, uh, Tristan Nunes, he's actually closing in on a Bomarito as well. So we're getting closer again to having all four cars almost in contention with one another. This is a long, long way to go. Uh, um, I think Montoya is going to get a little bit frustrated here. I think, I think he probably feels the car is quicker than that. Uh, 1 minute 54s that car is doing since uh, Castronovas took over. In the earlier part of the race, Cameron in number six car, he was doing 52s and 53s. Jimmy Naus is in the Netherlands, Shea Adam, and has tweeted at him to radio, it's time for Jerome Blake and Morland. We're following him and supporting him as ever uh, from the Netherlands. Well, it's almost time for Jerome Blake and but Ben Keating has not yet met the minimum drive time, so he has taken the number 33 back out, just exited the pit lane here a few moments ago. That's the sound of the number 25 BMW leaving. Four tires and fuel for Tom Blundfist, but the number 24 is no longer Jesse Krohn. That is now John Edwards. That car also getting four tires and fuel. The two BMWs going out line astern. As the Corvette comes past them and goes ahead, Porsche flashing it light, its lights as well. Coming through 
Now that's significant, that's Antonio Garcia and Nick Tandy, and they stopped much, much earlier on. They're on nothing like the same strategy. So Garcia's jumped both of the BMWs by getting in early. Nick Tandy jumped one at the moment, but he's looking at the back of the 25 car and wonders if he can get through and pass Tom Blomqvist, maybe down into turn five. My, that BMW, the 25 is the one with the red grill. Subtle differences to the uh, to the paint scheme on the two BMWs. The 25 has the red, red stripe down the bonnet and the red grill. The 24 is the blue. Now still the two leaders, Oli Gavin and Lawrence Van Tour, have not stopped at the front of the GT Le Mans field. In fact, Oh. Wait a minute, there's just been a change there. Number yeah, where's Oli Gavin gone? Has, he hit, yeah, has no, he hit the pit lane? No, he hasn't. He's just been overtaken on that last And he's dropped four seconds. Time. Exactly right. What's happened there to Wally Gavin? I was just about to say, we haven't had those guys in yet, and I just saw the Porsche flash yeah. by in close contact with Oli Gavin, and Indeed. no sign of the Ford. My first thought was, where's the Ford gone? The answer is four seconds up the road. That's right. I think Gavin had been struggling on it with his tyres the last uh, few laps because uh, number 67 car had drawn closer and closer and closer. was right on his tail for the last half a dozen laps. And in the meantime, the 912 Porsche, having fallen as much as seven seconds back, was reducing that gap quite significantly. So the number four car was certainly holding up number 67, but now Ryan Briscoe has got through into the lead of the race. He's going to try and pull away again. Uh, pull away now before he will make his first pit stop of the day. Well, we'll see in a moment or two whether Ollie Gavin has been off the track because I think he's coming into the pit lane. 48 Lamborghini Huracan, Corey Lewis, of course, inherited the lead when Bleak and Mullen had that problem with the rear suspension. He's coming up the hill now with the prototype number 31 on his tail, that's still people Durrani. Durrani blasts through. Great battle going on then between Ford, Corvette, Porsche at the front of the GT Le Mans field. None of those cars have stopped. Neither has the 67. The first car who stopped then is the C7R of Antonio Garcia. That's number three car. Oh, off, off for the 912. Championship leader at Canada Corner under pressure from the Corvette, and Vato's dropped it. He's managed to come straight back on, but he's lost a position to Dirk Muller, who's right on the tail now of Oli Gavin, who's fighting a rear guard action. Now, Oli didn't peel off there, did he? Into the pit lane? I don't think so. I felt sure he'd be coming in. Yes, he did. Yes, he did, because he's not in front of the Ford. It's such a long run to the pit entry line. That caught me out there. Championship leader Trent Hinman in from a top 10 position in the Acura NSX. Shea Adam, you've got Ollie Gavin, the man that started on pole, and the championship leader in GTD in the pits. Steel and tires only for Trent Hinman. His driving duties not yet done, although he's already had a lot of seat time this weekend, driving in the Michelin Pilot Challenge as well. Oliver Gavin into the pit lane, and Tommy Milner jumps off the wall. It's just right when those two are sharing a Corvette. It's like the world is back in order. This Corvette has a little bit of blue paint on the left side of it, as if a, a Ford has perhaps gotten up to to the left rear quarter panel of it, maybe giving it a little kiss. Uh, there's no significant damage to the car, though, as it comes off the airjacks. That was tire change done in 17 seconds. What an impressive effort from this crew. Tommy Milner is looking around. He's watching in the rear view mirror. Tommy Milner resumes his racing duties for the first time since Watkins Glen. Ah, oh, yes, good point. Welcome back. Broken hand for Tommy. He's still got a soft cast on to Give him a little bit of support, out he comes. Where does he cycle back in? Heads down towards turn one, checks his mirrors. Now, was there a little bump and run by Ryan Briscoe in the Ford? Coming down to Canada corner, Ollie Gavin right in the middle of the road. So they came out of the corner. Oh, no, it was, I think, just a drag by. Yeah. Going into Bill Mitchell corner. Now, was there a tuck tap just there as they went in side by side? Maybe. Clearly, the number four car struggling there. To, you just can't get the power grip. down. Correct. Yeah. And also struggling on breaking into the corner. Yeah, Same yeah. issue, Jeremy. Yeah. That have been coming for a few laps before that uh, as well. So with the benefit of a new set of tyres, 
and a fresh Michelin grip for Tommy Milner. He heads through turn five. And now we start to see the GT Daytona stops coming in at uh, round about, what's that, uh, 40, 40 minutes in? Just under that. Yeah, a bit more than that, is it 40, 46 minutes, yeah. Yeah. So in comes the AMG GT3 of the Lone Star Racing number 74, I can tell you that easily, because that's right opposite us, the McLaren is in and out. It's the 76 car, Matt Plum brought it in after a very hairy moment earlier on when he was running in fourth position. Four GTs, first and second in GT Le Mans. They've got two very fast cars and they've got two very fugal, frugal cars as well. We've said this before, powered by the V6, three and a half litre Eco Boost. Plenty of boost, but plenty of Eco as well. Those cars by far the most fuel efficient in GTLM. And Ryan Briscoe, eight seconds ahead of his teammate Dirk Muller, but they've got 10 seconds, or another two seconds rather, on the Porsche, which hasn't stopped yet. That's Lawrence Van Tour. It's the first car that stopped is Antonio Garcia, who is one minute behind the leader. So, the first car that has made its stop in GT Le Mans sits in fourth position. And that is the best place then of the cars that's made its stop one minute behind. Nick Tandy stopped first in the 911, but has not been able to turn that into quite as much of an advantage as Tony Garcia did. He's got Tom Blomqvist between him and the Corvette. And John Edwards right behind him in the BMW number 24. So different strategies being played out here. Battles going on right in front of the GT Le Mans cars. We've got two GTD cars through turn eight. It's the 63. That's the WeatherTech Ferrari. And the Lexus right in behind it. They are battling for position. That's the 12 car. And we've trying to get the way through there. It's the BMW number 24 of John Edwards. He had Nick Tandy in his sights for a moment, but he hasn't been able to get past those GTDs. John weaving left, then right, as he sees Tandy disappearing down the road. Frustration for the BMW driver. Nothing he can do. He's going to have to dive bomb down the inside in the Canada corner. Gets the Lexus, but can't get the Ferrari. At Imsa Radio, if you want to get in touch. Let's have your thoughts on the race so far an hour and 51 to go here's the man that started on pole position ollie gavin ollie the corvette seemed completely untouchable on those fresh michelin tires of course you did some qualifying laps on them but still you just ran away from the pack what was it like to just pull away from briscoe i mean that's that's kind of um was it was a nice little section of the race but this is endurance race you've got to try and make everything last over that over that distance and uh, came up a little bit short on that you know we've uh, had to pitch slightly out of sequence you know we're just waiting now for a caution and just to sort of see how we can cycle back through everyone else pretty much everyone else has to pit still but yeah it was tough at the end there on those qualifying tires and uh, you know it, it hasn't maybe falling completely how we wanted it to but you know there's still plenty of racing to go uh, Tommy's in the car now and uh, we've learned something from that that stint and we'll be applying it for these next two one of the BMWs and one of the Porsches stopped early and your sister car stopped early as well might we see you guys squeeze in an extra stop somewhere to get fresher tires on the car when everybody else is running on old rubber oh don't ask me that question that's up to these guys sitting next to me they're, they're the brains of the operation so uh, yeah we'll just have to see Thanks, Ollie. Fantastic first step. Thanks. The top seven in GT Daytona in the pits at the same time. A little mistake by Anthony Imperato as he came to a stop. He overran his pit and they had to let the car roll back so they could get the fuel, fuel hose in it. Driver change for the number 14. High stand already out of that car. 
Uh, it looks like Robbie Foley getting out of the tourney BMW shit. Confirmed, and Bill Oberlin is gonna have four new Michelin tires. They're just waiting on the fuel for that car. Also into the pit lane down this end, the number 57. That is the Caterpillar Acura. Catherine Lake taking that over. First car back out of the pit lane. The number 48, Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. Brian Sellers, orange helmet in that one. Nine, Fat Porsche is the second one to get rolling. Next, the number 14, Lexus. That's Jack Hawksworth's bright green helmet behind the wheel. Then we get Bill Powers. Bill Turner takes the nine. 96 Turner Motorsports BMW into action. Bill Oberlin, excuse me, I was trying to make Bill Oberlin a member of the Turner family, which he pretty much is. A 57 Acura is next to go. Then is the number 73 Porsche. That is Patrick Long. And then the 91 Wright Motorsport Porsche. That one with Dennis Olson, race winner at Lime Rock Park. A lot of fair use who is watching the in-car cameras via IMSA.TV, listening into IMSA Radio as well. Sirius 2 or 2 if you're here in the US. RS2 on the Radio Show Limited player. Around the world with no blocks or brakes. And we've got the video as well if you're not in the US or a territory that has a network TV deal. NBCSN later on today for the guys up in Charlotte to make the call for you. Along with their pit lane team here on site, of course. So, into the pit lane, Ryan Briscoe for the first of the Ford stops. That'll let Dirk Muller go through into the lead. He's 10 seconds further back. No, he's coming as well. So it'll be both Chip Ganassi cars that come in, the light blue car first, and also Lawrence Vanter coming in as well. The end of lap number 27. That's a good long first in for these guys. An hour and 47 to go. Still two stops required, though, to get up to the end of the race. Shit, Adam. For the number 67 Ford GT race winner last time out, we saw them claim victory by not filling the car completely on any one of their three stops. Well, it looks like they're going to be putting every last drop in it here today. Richard Westbrook has taken over for Ryan Briscoe. Tire change in 18 seconds, so slightly slower than what the Corvette was able to accomplish a little bit further up the pit lane. For the 912, it is also Bam Thor changing seat positions as Rick is waiting for the Fuel probe to come out, and it should now. 32 seconds of fuel showing up on the side of the car, so pretty close. Driver change is done at 912. They are waiting on the right side tire change to be completed. And 66 forward now with Joey Hand behind the wheel. Man, he loves Road America. He is leading the pit box. His total stationary time, 34 seconds, so two seconds slower than the sister car is the number 66. But the 912 Porsche is still stationary on the pit lane. It came in third behind two Fords. And it's going to leave third behind two Fords, but well behind both of them as he just gets the car in motion, does Earl Bamber. Sound, the unmistakable sound of the flat six being revved within an inch of its life. The new car, deep in its development and testing program, the second generation, or the new generation of the 991 RSR. From the pictures that I've seen in the video and a little bit of chat with people who've seen it on circuits around the world. Not quite the same noise as far as the car is concerned with the exhaust going straight down. Just to reiterate the problem from earlier on for the 33. But Bill Riley run. AMG GT3, as Shea said, it was broken suspension. Actually very impressed that the Michelin tyre held on there. It still had air in it when it came in after being driven at a jaunty angle. So somewhere around the track, Ben Keating may be catching the edge of a kerb. Certainly didn't see any contact with anyone else. Just a bit of bad luck there, I'm afraid, for the 33. Now the new... 911 RSR, as I say, with uh, exhaust that pretty much goes straight down and exit in front of the back wheel. So that will change the noise. Very loud inside the car, I'm told. So, one hour and 45 minutes to go. Jeremy Shaw will take some comments from you in a moment after our Cadillac in-race updates with everyone now having completed one pit stop. Elio Castro Neves leads by a second and three quarters in the seven Acura from his six teammate Juan Montoya. 
Another second further back is Jonathan Bomarito in the first of the Masters, that's the 55. Five seconds further back, Tristan Nunes in the 77 Mazda. Accurate, accurate, Mazda, Mazda. Five seconds further back from that, people, Durrani is the best of the Cadillacs, the 31 wheel and red and white car has 11 seconds on the gloss black Renga van der Zander driven number 10 Cadillac of the Cunningham and Alta racing team. 16 seconds further back from that as the prototype field's getting spread out. Philippe Albuquerque in the number five Mustang sampling Cadillac. It's the dark grey car. Then Colin Brown's just a couple of seconds behind him and has been closing down on Philippe Albuquerque over the last few laps. And you like the symmetry we've got right now because we've got the 10 prototype cars on a lap of their own. We've got the LMP2 cars one lap down to the overall leaders. We've got all the yeah. GTLM cars one lap behind them and we've got all the uh, GTD cars one lap behind that. Is that good for you? No, you, I, you like I, symmetry? I do, I do like symmetry. But what's interesting to me, I've just been watching the gaps between the leaders uh, and uh, Elliot castro -Nevis. he's just turned his best lap of the race last time around, a 152.6, but the uh, Jonathan Bomarito in the third place Mazda car number 55, he has been inching closer and closer to the second place car of the championship leader, Juan Pablo Montoya in car number six. Get to that battle in just a moment as we run down the GT Le Mans and GT Daytona runners, three Corvette, Tony Garcia, courtesy of that early stop from his teammate, Jan Magnussen, leading from in second place, the BMW of Tom Blomqvist. 4.4 seconds, eight seconds further back from those two, the 911 of Nick Tandy. He's got a second on John Edwards in the 24 BMW. Then it's five seconds back to Richard Westbrook in the 67 Ford. That's the light blue car. He's got Tom Milner right up his tailpipes. Actually, just got out to about a second, that one. And the 66 of Joey Hand, is six seconds ahead of Earl Bamba, who is in eighth position in the 912. In GTD, Brian Sellers has taken over the 48 car. They have not lost the lead on the pit stop. Uh, pit stop run. Then it's Matt Campbell, Australian young Porsche professional, in second place by about seven and a half seconds. He's got 4.3 seconds back to Matt Plum, who's recovering in the 76 car, back up to third position now as the battle for the lead second. goes down to the first corner. Battle for second, should I say. All three of them were together as they went past us through traffic. And for a moment, we had Jonathan Bomarito right alongside as they crossed the line. There was only nine tenths of a second between all three. Something hanging off the back of one of those cars. It's the Mazda. The Mazda's got a piece of loose bodywork. Or is it one of the tail lights it's the tail light from the left rear of the uh, sorry from the right rear of the rear wing there's a tail light on there and it's popped loose and it's hanging by its electrical connection that's how fast Jonathan Bomarito, he's not driving the wheels of it, but he is driving the lights of it <laughs> at the moment and the man who knows all about that is Juan Montoya just 0 0.079 between those two as they crossed the line last time around. Just to finish off our GTD rundown, it's Porsche, it is a Lamborghini, Porsche, McLaren, Lexus, BMW, Acura, Ferrari, seven different manufacturers in the top seven. Tony Vlander now on, aboard the 63 WeatherTech car, and that is your Cadillac in race update brought to you by Cadillac V Series. Because real racers don't take time off. Now, are we going to see some mid-race strategic chicanery here? Shea Adam down in the pit lane. I have two pit boards ringing, Don. One is yellow, one is pink. They are both from the Mazda team, as both Mazdas will be coming in to make stops this lap through. And Harry Tinknell has been ready. This time, he's got his helmet on. He will be getting behind the wheel of the 55. Reacting to that are the 31 Whelan Engineering Cadillac and the number 10 Conic Minolta Cadillac. Both teams have just noticed Mazda up on the wall and are scrambling there, guys, too. Still 100 minutes of racing to go here. So we're getting close to be able to go with just... Well, I don't think we can go with one more stop. I think it's two stops from here. And the top four are in the pit lane together. And my goodness me, there's nothing between them. Even at pit lane speed, the Mazda pulls into its 
pit lane just about first because it's the first one there and Shea Adam is trying to watch four cars at once. I'll watch three of the four at least. It's a time change for the number seven. Birthday boy as of yesterday, Ricky Taylor gets aboard the number seven. They are doing four tires and fuel. It's four tires and fuel as well for the number 77, but that is still Tristan Nunez staying aboard. They have given him a new drinks bottle. A tear off was that simple to get the tail light removed from the number 55 Mazdas. It was quite a high up hit. And very dangerous. It's going to be tight, it's going to be tight. They're cleaning out the ducts at the front of the Acura number seven. And the Acura number six, excuse me, Montoya stayed in, he's not out. He might not get out in front of the Masters here, no, he does, he just slides in front of the Master. There was just an Acura's gap between his teammate and the first of the Masters coming down the pit lane. They spent a lot of time cleaning out the ducts on the front wing, either side of the number six car. First, second, and third, there's not a cast length between them, barely a cast length between them at the moment as they came out. How in the world did Juan Montoya manage to slip into that gap? Tignal on the pit lane speed limit, it couldn't close up to the other Acura, of course, and make it difficult for him. The car that's dropped away a little bit is Tristan Nunez, but he did come in a tiny bit behind. They're climbing the hill. May have took a little bit more fuel, of course. I wonder if there were time stops for the first three. Jeremy trying to remember our Porsche keys to the race track position. And one way that you can influence track position is by varying your fuel load with pretty much on 100 minutes when they came in. I'm not sure they can go with just one more stop anyway. Hmm. It's got to be two stops from here for all of the top four. Oh, absolutely. So you might be playing with the fuel loads here to try and get that track position. Yeah, no, it's a minimum of two stops from, from here. Yeah. At IMSA Racing, if you, at, at IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, Jeremy Shaw, Shea Adam and me, John Hindorf. It's really warming up here in terms of the competition, the cloud cover though is gathering as well. We'll bring you up to date with what's going on in the other classes as the rest of the DPI stops are happening now. We'll get a word from someone who's seen this close competition firsthand. Jonathan Bomarito out in the pit lane with Shea Adam. <laughs> Jonathan Bomarito getting a lot of praise from all of his teammates. You got out of the car, took a cold water bottle and poured it over your head. Just how difficult were the conditions out there when you were battling against everybody else. That 55 miles will look strong. Yeah, we're pretty good right now. We're, we're good on uh, strategy, good pit stops. We just got Harry in. Um, car's pretty good. It's really trying. We've been, because it's so hot out, we've been, uh, you know, fighting a little bit of rear tire degradation, the rear going loose through the run. So I was really trying to manage that, and we kind of got our head wrapped around it now. So I think, uh, I think we're going to be strong at the end of this thing. We'll see what happens. But everybody on the Mazda, Team Yost is doing a great job. We're uh, going for three in a row for Mazda. Do you know who actually knocked your right rear tail light off? Because that was dangling when you came in for your pit stop. Not real sure. <laughs> uh, I saw that too. I got out of the car and I was like, oh, that's not good. But we finished Watkins Glen with worse damage than that. So uh, I think we're okay. Well, and with Watkins Glen, the finishing driver was Harry Tignall here. It looks like the finishing driver will be Harry again. His mentor and coach and, and general guy to look up to, Alan McNish, hanging around this weekend. What's it like having him on your pit box? And when you guys are doing the same speeds that he was doing around here in the R10 in 08. Yeah, it's cool to have Alan in the, in the box with us and just around. Uh, just his his vibe and, uh, you know, he's kind of seen everything and done it all before. So he's been a huge asset to Harry and... Uh, and everybody that kind of is around him, you know? So it's been good. Like you said, Harry finished Watkins. Uh, he'll do an amazing job for us right now, and let's keep our heads down. Hey, you've earned another bottle of cold water to pour over yourself. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. I like the, yeah, I saw that uh, tail light hanging up. I have no clue what happened there. Top three coming out of the carousels. Jonathan Bomarito out of the Mazda number 55. Harry Tinknell's taking it over. Cycling through to the head of the field, Renke van der Zander and Philippe Albuquerque uh, and Simon Trummer. But of course, they are all stopping. Trummer in the pit lane, Albuquerque's just left and Renke van der Zander has just joined Shea Adam in the pit lane. <laughs> And he'll be staying here because that was the sound of Jordan Taylor tanking Ranger's car back out on the track. Four tires and fuel for the glossy black Cadillac. Spin for Catherine Legg in the 57. That car up as high as eighth position. Uh, Pat Long's already gone through. 
Cat and Pat were having the battle. Looks like the 57 was somewhat recalcitrant to restart, but the engine is now running again. Oh, and there's damage on the front of the number 73 Park Place Porsche. I think that was a turn six that we were looking at there, or oh, maybe a little bit further back even down the road. That was down at turn five. Oh, and Catherine ran right into the back of Patrick Long at five. Did he repay the conf compliment at uh, turn six? Oh, no, it was the other Porsche. It was the 91 that uh, hit the cat car, and then that spun around, and the front of the 73 got damaged in avoidance. Well, two Porsches ganging up there on the Caterpillar car, which is off again as Cat's trying to get that car back, but I think there's too much damage on the left rear. Looks like suspension damage at the very least on that car, and Pat Long will be bringing the 73 car in as well. So it was Dennis Olsen who actually made contact with Catherine. The 73, very badly damaged at the front as the leader. Oh, no. Oh, no. The, this is the Acura coming in. This is out of sequence. I was about to say the leader, but, of course, it isn't the leader. Uh, it is Ricky Taylor coming into the pit lane. He was. And Pat's tyre, Pat Long's tyre is just blown. He's gone past the pits. He really should have come in. Debris all down the front straight as the battling Acura and the 55 coming in. I wonder if they sense in the seven car, which has just been in a couple of laps ago, do they sense it, a full course caution or is it something else here? There's damage to the left front of this car, John. There's a big piece of carbon wedged under the left front. They're calling for the air jack to actually be lifted up because it is so well stuck under the front of this car. It looks like it was almost glued there, but it looks like it might be from the splitter of the 73. That's all they did was take that out. I didn't even see the fuel probe come over the wall. Well, I think they really should have brought the 73 of Pat Long in. There was excessive damage at the front. And they would have seen that on the pictures. And now they're going to lose more time. Pat Long, innocent party in all of that, got nerfed at the rear, going into turn five by Catherine Long. Catherine Long then got a hip check from... Den uh, sorry, Catherine Legg got a hip check from Dennis Olsen, which spun her around. That clipped the front of Patrick Long in the 73 car, which is now exceedingly damaged. And we've got two penalties from those two incidents. No surprises that Catherine Legg gets the first penalty for the bump and run on Pat Long. And then Dennis Olsen gets the penalty at turn six for the hip check on Catherine Legg. And... Well, that was untidy, to say the very least. Not impressive driving by any of them there. And Catherine Long has picked up a puncture on the left rear. She'll get that fixed, but then she'll get the drive-through. Can't take the penalty while she comes in for service. So she's lost a lot of time in that exchange. There's a bit of carbon missing from the left rear of this Acura. It could have been this bit that was wedged in the front of Ricky Taylor's car. As No, actually, it was pushed up underneath the left rear of the car. So they have put a new Michelin on just one tire, pulled out a bit of damaged uh, car. It's like it flung with bits of carbon. That was nice. And Cat gets going once more. Well, as I say, uns untidy to say the least. Meantime, in GT Le Mans, well, almost something this happening. Is, this is a battle for second, third, fourth, and fifth, effectively. We're on board with car number four, but uh, just ahead of him is number 67, ahead of him is the 24, ahead of him is the 911, uh, and quite a long way ahead of them now is number three car, with number 25 BMW, Tom Blunkis, having made a pit stop last time around. So that was uh, somewhat early, with an hour and a half remaining in this race. Could have, I guess they could be just doing a, a short stint, but uh, I wouldn't... I don't know, we'll see. Maybe their, their tyre degradation hasn't been particularly good, and they're just going to kind of equalise stops from here. Mm, split the race up into manageable chunks, possibly. So 911 is in the pits, OK. Uh, yeah, he was the first car to stop last time down the pit lane. Not all pit lane True. speed limiteds are created equal. This Nick Tandy actually makes a pass in the pit lane. 
Um, the 38 Aurea coming in slowly because it has a right rear puncture. It's legal if so long as you're still on the pit lane speed limit. The 911 was the first car to stop. Patrick Pele was the first man into the pits. He got out of the car at that point, but it looks like Nick Tandy's staying in. He is, and it's not often that you can get Nick Tandy willingly out of a car, especially when it's here at Road America. So he will be staying aboard for new Michelin tires for Nick and a lot of fuel. It was just the puncture that caused performance tech to come into the pit lane, so they now are off strategy. But they gave James French four new Michelin and a little bit more fuel to go even further. The 911 is still in the pit lane, and the pit board is also now for the number three Corvette. So those two cars came in together, and we're about to see them come in one lap apart this time by. Huge crowd down at turn five. Hope you're listening in on 88.3 FM around the circuit as the park place car and what remains of it comes in to the pit lane with, I'm sure, a very disappointed Pat Long. Hello to Sebring 12 fan who's just sent a great panoramic view down there, enjoying the sunshine and the racing. Pass on our best to everybody down there as the car comes to a halt. Uh, some of the bodywork of the 73 car does not shit, Adam. Um, no, the bumper slid about another seven feet forward. The nose on this car is dangling on the right-hand side. The radiator grill is completely twisted as if some giant has used it as a braid. Uh, it's gonna be quite a bit of work for the front of this car. Now, if I run around the back of the car because that's where most of the damage was, was it not, John? that it was hit from behind. It was hit both ends by Catherine Legg. First of all, when she tapped Pat going into turn five, Slight. then when she, she was hit by Dennis Olsen and turned around, uh, she it ran into, effectively, uh, Pat had nowhere to go, and she and uh, Catherine scraped across the front of his car. The damage at the rear of the car is minimal. It's the right rear, by and large, and the dive plane at the back, effectively, and the splitter has been pushed up, but other than that, it's not bad. Battle for the lead. Harry Tinkle around the outside of turn one and pulls it off. Just the one Acura and the one Master battling in the front of the field since the number seven car came in to have that piece of carbon removed. Tignall needs no second invitation, drags past Montoya on the start-finish line and goes through round the outside into turn one. We've seen some spectacular overtaking manoeuvres this weekend in some of the other series that have already raced. If you haven't seen the last lap of the Michelin Pilot Challenge, then I urge that you're going hunt it down because there was some spectacular stuff in there, and that's right up there with them from Harry Tinknell, right round the outside at turn one, and Mazda lead with an hour and 26 minutes to go. Yeah, I think uh, Montoya was just held up a little bit coming onto the straight, and that enabled Harry Tinknell to get a really, really good run on him. I've been looking at the, uh, in, the, the maximum speeds, of the uh, terminal speeds of these cars, and they've been pretty closely matched, all of them in DPI. So it wasn't that the Mazda was just, is generally faster on the straights. That was just a, a bit of a slingshot there and a really brave move around the outside side of Juan Pablo Montoya, no less, into turn one. That's, uh, that's a heck of a move by, uh, by Harry Tignall. Uh, Pat Long, did he go back into the paddock there, Shea? Surely they haven't sent him back out <laughs> on track with no front splitter. I, I mean, Patrick Long is one of the best race car drivers in the world, in my opinion, but surely he can't manhandle this thing around with no splitter. He's going to go out and complete this lap and then come back in, and hopefully by that point they'll have the extra front splitter ready to go because it was not out here on the wall, so they're making sure that he's not losing laps, but oh my goodness, is that car going to be a handful for Patrick? It's going to look like something from Mad Max as well as he comes through next time around. Still waiting for the 91 to serve a penalty as well. Dennis Olsen for the hip check on Catherine Legg after she'd driven into the back of Patrick Long. Uh, 91 coming into the pits now, in fact, as I say that. One, two, three, cut four cars flash by me in at least three different classes as they went across the line. So take the lead. Waiting for him to come back across the line now. GT Daytona, Brian Sellers leads it by 3.299 seconds. 
Lamborghini from Matt Campbell in the number nine Faf, the plaid Porsche. Then it's Matt Plum, another five and a half seconds further back. JT Le Mans, fascinating with cars on vastly different strategies. John Edwards leads it after a very early pit stop again by Nick Tandy. They're maximizing the life of their Michelin tires by getting new ones on as quick as they can. Means they're spending more time in the pit lane, but their pace is good. Edwards from West booked by just half a second. 24 BMW from 67, the light blue Porsche, their Ford, excuse me. Then Tom Milner is a, another four tenths back. The top three then separated by a second. The four Corvette in third position. Then it's an 11 second gap back to Joey Hand in the 66 board. That Ford, that's the red, white, and blue Ford GT. He's got five seconds on Earl Bamba, who's got 30 seconds on Blomqvist. He's got Tonio Garcia right up his tailpipes. And 27 seconds further back, Nick Tandy on the different strategy. In comes Pat Long for some more bodywork to be refitted to the 73 car. She'll keep an eye on that as we're watching the battle at the front of GT Le Mans with the leader coming through it at turn number three. Down at the far side of the circuit, onto the middle straight here that runs almost parallel, but in the opposite direction to the front straight, but it's at a much lower level. Past, back the pa back, past the back of the paddock, which I'd never started that, <laughs> down into turn five, and then the little climb up under the Corvette bridge. How will the leaders coming through affect this battle? And it's danger time for Juan Montoya as well, as he's picking his way through. Doesn't want to let the Mazda of Harry Tinknell get too far up the road. Already 3.2 seconds, and that's growing as he comes to turn eight at the bottom of Harry Downs. Now into the carousel, he'll go around the outside. The prototype with way more downforce picks his line. Oh, did come right in on the BMW there. I'm not sure John, John Edwards will be very happy about that. Gave him enough room, but only just. That last lap, by the way, by car number 55, Harry Tickman, taking the having taken the lead, that was his fastest lap of the race, a 51.9, and all of a sudden, he's three seconds clear of Montoya. Nunes is coming as well, Jeremy. Yes, he is. He's got the 77 car this is that we're talking about, the second of the Masters. He's picked his way through the traffic very nicely indeed, and now he's got Juan Montoya in his sights as well. I'm still not entirely certain that... Uh, well, we certainly haven't seen the last of the pit stops from the front of the field. I think at least two more yep. in the next 81 minutes. Once we get down to about 40 minutes or thereabouts, we know the Mazdas can go from there. But they've been out quite a long time already. So will they decide to go long and splash at the end, or will they take a short stint now and then stop around about the... 35, 40 minute mark to go. That's the interest for me right now. The worry is, of course, if you get, if you do that and take a short stint in the middle of the race and get caught the wrong side of a full course caution, because you pretty much, now you don't lose a lap here, but you lose a lot of ground. Now Porsche keys to the race, track position, which includes the pit stop, of course. It's a long lap here. So you've got to get your fuel right. But I think more than anything this weekend, particularly for the GT cars. It's all about the left front tyre. Fantastic battling. A couple of laps ago, before the pass was made, Harry Tinknell all over the back of Juan Montoya, right round the previous lap, dancing left and right. Tried at turn one, tried at turn five. There was a touch on the exit of turn five. Montoya weaving about at least three times. Mm. That'll be being looked at by race control. And then finally, as they came through, there was another little tap as they came across the start-finish line as Harry just hooked the front of his car under the rear of Montoya, but then used the draft to go around Juan Pablo into turn one. Montoya known for his, shall I say, stout defence. Doesn't give much quarter, Juan Montoya. Even when he's passing back markers, he's pulled into a few in his sports car career as well. Relatively short ones as well. 
And, and Wafab Motoy, he responds with the, not only his fastest lap, but the fastest lap oh, of wow. the race. A new rat record then for Juan Pablo Montoya, 1 minute 51.765. Even with that, though, he only pulled in uh, about mm, three or four tenths of a second on the race leader, Harry Tinknell. Tom Blomqvist, 25 BMW, in behind the GT3 version of his manufacturer's output. Coming through the kink, and he wants to be through as quick as he can. He's bottled up behind a prototype, and here comes Tonio Garcia through Canada corner. They both go past. Bill Oberlin, and it was the JDC Miller Motorsport bright yellow Cadillac that was coming through at the same time, which is why Blomqvist could not get through. And now they're coming up behind the Lexus as well as they climb the hill. And at the other end of the GT Le Mans battle, it's BMW number 24 versus Ford through turn five. We've also got a battle now for the lead in GTD because the number nine car, uh, Matty Campbell at the wheel of the FAF Motorsports Porsche, he's caught right up with Brian Sellers. Only about four or five laps ago, that gap was well over four seconds. It's come down steadily since then. And now as the two cars head uh, onto the back straight, out of turn three, I would, I would guess, or down towards turn five, perhaps, they're pretty much nose to tail. Tell you what, there's a lot of cars with bits and pieces of damage there, Jeremy. He's the top three now in GT Le Mans. Exit the carousel with the Corvette latching onto the back of the leading pair now. 24, 67 and 3. BMW, Ford and Corvette. And damage to the right rear of the BMW underneath the bumper line. And that's a crucial part of these GT Le Mans cars. That diffuser is aerodynamically very important. And I just seem to think that there's a little bit missing from behind the right rear wheel of the leading BMW. That's John Edwards, number 24. Have another look when it, it's on the wrong side for me. Maybe she can look from the, the wall there. First, second and third in GTLM. By the way, bad news for Porsche and Park Place fa fans as the 73 of Pat Long and Patrick Lindsay, the Pat Mobile, has gone back behind the wall. Pat will be absolutely fuming. None of that was his fault. Battle for the lead then in GT Le Mans, down at turn three. Yeah, there's just a little bit of damage behind the wheel. I can see more of the wheel on the right-hand side than I can on the left. It might not be the diffuser, though. Maybe it's just a little bit of the... Rear valance on that BMW. They're halfway around the lap at the moment, heading down towards turn five. And Richard Westbrook in full attack mode, as is Tom Milner. Back in IMSA competition for the first time since Watkins Glen in July. Tom desperate to get back behind the wheel of the car. Fair play to him, he has been at all the races and supporting his team. And this battle's getting really, really tight. All of them pushing hard, hard enough that John Edwards completely fell off the end of the curb at turn seven, bouncing his BMW into the air for a moment, but has actually pulled out a bit of a gap there. That might be the line through there then. To the king, an hour and 16 minutes to go. Battles in all of the classes at the moment still to be resolved. No chance for putting any money on the winners or even the top threes at the moment. This is IMSA Racing at its best in fabulous surroundings. Road America rightly termed America's National Park of Speed. With GT and prototype cars mixing it up for at least another 75 minutes. Yeah, all green race so far and a, a very fast pace being set at the front of the field. <laughs> oh, dear me. Very close indeed. Colin Brown comes to the outside of the number 10 Cadillac. That isn't a battle for position. Oh, is it a battle for position? I think it might be. The five and the 54 five. is, yeah. Yes, it's the five, not the 10. My apologies. 
to battle for sixth position. It is the battle for sixth, and Colin Brown was right up alongside the Mustang sampling car. Yeah. The Nismo power plant punches him out of turn three, and yeah. under the Sargento bridge, I think he's gone through. Yeah. But there's no doubt to me that Philippe Albuquerque will get in the draft and then try and throw it down the inside at turn five. Lots of spectators down there. Behind them, the battle for first, second, and third in GT Le Mans is just coming past you if you're at turn five, listening on 88.3. Where do you look? look? Wherever you look, there's yeah. stuff happening, Jeremy. And again, heading down now, probably towards turn three, is that battle with GTD, the number 48 and the number nine car there, the nose to tail now. Brian Sellers leads in car number 48, but Maddie Campbell is caught right up in, in that fast portion. That is the car that won last time out at Lime Rock Park in GTD. Mazda leads with Tinknell by 2.8 seconds. In GT Le Mans, BMW, John Edwards leads, but by the narrowest of margins, 48. Lamborghini Huracan leads in GTD. They've just gone through turn five. The Faf Porsche right in behind as we head down to Shea Adam with uh, an update on that GT Le Mans battle. She's got uh, a BMW driver, none other than Jesse Crow. Yes, yeah, so you must be so happy to come back here to Road America every year, the site of your IMSA win, your only one so far, hoping to make it two today. John, leading out there, there appears to be a bit of damage to the right rear of the car, but it's not slowing him down. Has he noticed yet? I don't know. To be honest, I didn't notice until you said it. So, uh, so far, the pace looks all right. Uh, I think everybody is on different fuel strategies, so it's a little bit hard to predict what will happen. But so far, it's, it's not looking too bad. Is it going to come down to whoever pits last, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think uh, some some people are on a three-stop strategy, some are on a two-stop strategy, so uh, I think wh whoever can play the fuel game the best will uh, will win this one. You don't think it'll come down to new tires, whoever's on the freshest Michelins at the end? It can be if it's uh, if it's a yellow, but I think this, this uh, race will be more fuel limited for everyone. Good luck, fingers crossed. Thank Very you. Very interesting. Well, Porsche keys the race, pit stop and fuel definitely in there. Got to get your strategy right. And you have, and you know, it's a long pit lane here. I talked about it earlier on, uh, that the, the, the pit lane being such a, such a long one here, and with, this, with the pit lane speed limiter, it takes about 39 seconds to go all the way through the pit lane. Most of the tracks we go on, the, the average is about 30 seconds or so, so that extra 10 seconds uh, that it takes you to come through the pits and make, an extra, and make your service uh, is uh, mitigated against making an extra pit stop. And that said as well, Jeremy, that's 39 seconds where everyone else is flat out up the front straight. Oh, leader's gone off. Leader has just gone off the track, trying to pass, and in fact, had passed the number 76. That was uh, at turn number three at the bottom of the hill, and all of a sudden, Montoya's back there. Tinknell, with just a slight error of judgment there, put the left Michelin's in the dirt. Got back on again, regained his composure. But that's how tight it is at the front of the field. And all of a sudden, the excitement is ramped up once again. Tignal weaving left and right just to clean the Michelins up after he'd fallen off the track. But now he's got his head back together. He's got a huge amount of traffic ahead of him, including cars that are battling for the lead in GT Daytona. Catherine Leg back out with a little bit of loose bodywork at the back of the 57 car. You might it. have to come back in again as the leader comes up along the, alongside this battle. It's nowhere near three seconds now between Tinknell and Montoya after that small mistake. Montoya goes down the inside, puts tyres on the grass again, I think, as he was coming down to Canada Corner. Well, Harry's got the hurry up here with an hour and 10 minutes to go, and Montoya is in full attack mode behind him, trying to close him down. New leader in GTLM2, number 67, car comes through with a pretty good advantage that time over number 24 and the number four that remain locked together, the BMW and the Corvette. Ford looks really good round here, very stable platform. Battle for GT, Daytona lead across the line. Brian Sellers yeah. right on the pit wall. Matt Campbell in the Porsche, He's getting some draft. That's a pretty low slung Lamborghini ahead. Jinx out, two drivers left, but can't get late enough on the brakes. Catherine Lake up the speed in front of them, but with that left rear bodywork swinging around in the breeze. 
And here comes the 77 as well of Tristan Nunes. He'll want to get past this pair pretty quickly, but he's going to get by them on the back straight, or the middle straight, should I say. So that was fortuitous. Now, has Manny Campbell got a little draft from the prototype? He's coming round the long way down through the kink before turn five into the braking area. Brian Sellers moves back across on him in the braking area there. That's on the very ragged edge of defence here. Oh, was there a lock up there? I think there was from Matt Campbell just for a moment. Thought he was going to run into the back of the leader. GT Daytona leads, separated by nothing at all, these two cars. Catherine Lake laps down after contact and a penalty. She could play a part in this, possibly unwittingly. Lamborghini Huracan, Sellers from Porsche, 911 GT3R, Campbell, seven and a half seconds further back and taking a second a lap out of this battle at the moment is Matt Plum in the 720S McLaren. Yeah. Uh, the, the 24 BMW, by the way, as at Lime Rock, seems to be really struggling with his tyres now. right now. He's dropped from the lead, first of all to second place, and now on this next lap to third place behind the number four Corvette, and all of a sudden now, that 24 BMW, John Edwards has got Joey Hand all over him. Bit of news that affects the Sprint Cup Championship, one of the two non-full season championships here, Pat Long and the 73 Park Place car has come out from behind the wall with some new bodywork. So now, just on a points pickup, Catherine Legg has lifted off to let the leaders through and steers to the left-hand side. The GTD leader goes through. Can Campbell go through as well? Yes, he'll come through. Good driving by Catherine. As in comes Tristan Nunes from third position. The Mazda comes to a stop by Shea Adam down at the Mazda Yost Racing Pits. Fuel tires and driver change. Oliver Jarvis reinstalled into this Mazda. Scrubbed Michelin tires going on this car. They are very, very lightly used. Scrubbed in a morning warm up, as a matter of fact. And Oliver Jarvis being belted in. The door slams shut, waiting on the final tire change take place air comes out of the car so now it's back on its four michelins oh windshield tear off man that's much better for ollie jarvis now 26 seconds of fuel for that master it's interesting that came in just under 70 minutes that would suggest we'll see that car in with about 35 to go that works spot on one more stop for that car then before the end of the race that's the 77 car so they have shortened up a stint just a little bit as Ollie Jarvis rejoins the race, presumably he'll go to the end. The question will be, will they stick a fresh set of Michelins? Have they got a fresh set of Michelins to go to the end with Ollie and give him a little performance advantage? Shea Adam has been doing a bit of detective work and a bit of nosying around at the back of the Master Team Yost pit. I'm staring at the fresh Michelins that'll go on that car for the last stint of the race. I think that's really smart. I really do. Into the pit. The teammate car from the lead, Harry Tinknell. Pits through goes Montoya. Now, will, will the guys at Penske react to the two Mazdas coming in? They've sent Montoya around for one more lap. Harry Tinknell from the lead of the race in the 55 car. 66 minutes to go. And Shea Adam will watch this one for us. Fuel tires and a drinks bottle change for Harry Tinknell. And they actually give him an additional one that has just come out of the cooler with a straw attached. So Harry gets a little bit of fresh cold water as well as his new pressurized drink system. These are fresh Michelin tires. They do not look like they've been scrubbed. Uh, actually, no, they have been scrubbed. I can see a little bit of debris and detritus on them, but nothing too serious, just like uh, almost as if you walk through a forest with slightly wet feet and then get nice little bits of dirt on your feet. 23 seconds of fuel for this car, so an even shorter fill for the 55 Mazda. Yeah, they're going for their last, last stop at just under 40 minutes to go, aren't they? Now, let's see where Harry comes out and who's the next to jump from the leaders. Harry back on the circuit, big bump at the exit of the pit lane. Will be desperate to stay ahead of the number 86. GTD car and through he goes. Now who's that in behind? Guess what? It's an Acura. And it is the number seven car of Ricky Taylor. He must stay ahead of that car on the outlap. 
Slightly weaving left and right before Ricky gets too close. I think that's OK. He'll have to straighten it up now, though, as Ricky starts to close in down the run to turn five. This is crucial. This is not really an even battle because of the pit stop that Harry's just taken. But I think for the strategy and for our Porsche keys to the race, track position, I think this is absolutely massively important. Massively important right now. And Tinknell's getting those scrub Michelins up to speed. And now it's amazing. Halfway around the lap, you see the attitude of the car change and just sit down. And Montoya has had to respond. The number seven Acura team Penske in the pit lane shit. Adam, they've had to do this. They can't afford to let Tinknell get the benefit of those fresher tyres for too long. Interesting that they were planning on bringing him in anyway, but they did jump in action a little bit sooner when the Mazda came in. Dane Cameron, the pole sitter, he started this race. He will finish it, getting back into that number six Acura team Penske. They are putting four sticker, yes, they are brand new, Michelin's onto that car, so we'll have to see how the two uh, makes react differently to the two different types of tires. Perhaps the Acura saved an extra set, whereas the Mazda did, but the pit stop's still going on. It's still waiting for fuel. This seems like a much longer stop than either of the Mazdas, and now the Acura gets rolling once more. Dane Cameron this time behind the wheel. They are very assiduous about sweeping their hands in the ducts at the front of the car. He's not got back out anywhere near the Mazda, and in fact, his team car's gone through as well. So Harry Tinkle now in fourth position, but the first of the three stopped cars has got behind him the number seven of Ricky Taylor. So Ricky Taylor's had a bit of a win on that. Remember, he came in out of sequence to get the carbon fiber piece out from the underside of the car and it hasn't cost him too much but he will have to stop again of course i presume they'll send him as long as they can in that position just in case a safety car comes out dan cameron having taken over that number six car that leaves jordan taylor in the lead in the cadillac by 1.2 seconds from Philippe Nasser. No, he's just come back out of the pits. And John Edwards in that BMW is just really struggling. Dropping like that. He's, he's dro dropping three, four, five seconds a lap now to lead. I can't understand why they haven't brought that car in for a pit stop. I, I mean, he, he, yes, he can't make it from the end, I guess, uh, yet. That's why they're keeping him out there, but he's losing an awful lot of time. Same problem that car, those BMWs had at Lime Rock Park. They just chew up their Michelin tires and they have nothing left in the latter stages of their stint. Visiting me in the pit lane is the number four Corvette. That is Tommy Milner brought her in. We'll be taking her back out four tires and fuel. Just waiting on the fuel to finish for this Corvette. Also, just to let you know, the Michelin track temperature is 89 degrees in the air. That is 32 degrees Celsius for those of you Canadians out there. 106 Fahrenheit is the track temperature, which is 41 degrees. Well, getting down towards the last hour now, and the strategy's beginning to play out as everyone comes for their, in the prototypes, making their penultimate pit stops now. We're not too far away from the last pit stops from GTDs and GTLMs, just depending on, the again, the strategies. Jordan Taylor still leading by 25 seconds from Harry Tignall, but that is on the pit stops, don't forget. And Harry, last time around, was seven tenths of a second quicker than Jordan Taylor. That's how much, that's how much performance advantage newer tyres give. In the LMP2 battle, Matt McMurray and James French have just pitted 21 seconds apart when they came across the line, Shea Adam. Matt McMurray got four new tires and James French got none, but he's having trouble getting the car refired as he leaves the pit lane. There he goes. It was fuel only and a blowout of the air ducts for James French, and it was full service for Matt McMurray. It's been a good little battle today and still could go either way. It's a brave, brave decision not to do tires, but it does save a 
set maybe for later on in the race. Jordan Taylor comes in out of the lead in the glossy black Cadillac number 10. So Harry Tinkle will cycle back through. And now the 24 BMW of John Edwards come in, having dropped down to sixth position, having been battling for the lead. Yeah. It just uh, His teammate just went past him as he came into the pits. Well, you know, even if he can do an hour, we know the tyres won't do an hour, so he's going to have to stop again yeah. in that car. 24 BMW, nice relaxed pit stop from Rahal Letterman Lanigan. Brand new set of Michelins going on. I wonder if they've adjusted the compounds on that car. GT Le Mans, the only one with three compounds. Oh, there's a miss on the BMW engine. They did get him to try and start it up. And it's go now, though. That's a perfect getaway. Now, I said a moment or two ago that uh, Jordan Taylor was in the pit lane. Well, he's been joined by his brother, Ricky Taylor, as well. Shea Adam watching the stop. Oh, fascinating nose change going on for the number seven Acura. They are putting, are they going to put a new one on? Yes, they are. They have a new one on the wall that's coming over now. They have sticker Michelins going on to this Acura as well. So the Mazdas with scrubbed rubber, the Acuras with brand new compounds. They've yet to complete the change though because one guy has been doing the change all by himself for three of the tires. Now the fourth one needs to go on, but no, they didn't have it ready. They're losing time as the right front tire was not ready to go on the car while it's still up on the air jacks. They did a windshield tear off and Ricky Lee, 40 seconds elapsed for that pit stop. Compare that to the 26 we saw for the 55 Mazda. And on his out lap, James French fell off at the bottom of the hill at turn three. Meantime, the wards for the BMW number 24 continue. It's come out of the pits, but it's not up to speed. Not up to speed at all as it comes under the Sargento Bridge. And I'm not sure that car's even going to get past, back to the pits. It's, I think it's coasting down to turn five, he might go straight on at turn five and pull into the back of the paddock. I think that's what he is gonna do, he's letting cars go by. No, he's got some power, but not very much. That seems to, it's either coasting or it's on limp home mode or something like that. Or has the pit lane speed limit it got jammed on? But this is terrible stuff for the 24 car, which had already been dropping time. Wow, this is extraordinary. Extraordinary bad luck for BMW, who started the week with such high hopes. Put the car on pole position, only to see that lost in post-qualifying tech. Both the cars, a couple of mil too low and thrown to the back of the grid. So, Jeremy, I wonder if that was something more fundamental for the 24 car than, than just the tyres going away. Maybe there was a, a problem coming on on that car. It's just been exacerbated by coming in. Yeah. He did stop the engine in the pits, and it was a bit recalcitrant firing up again. He's driving on all the rubbish on the outside of the carousel. So he's, he knows that there's something fairly fundamentally wrong with that car. I think he's just going to struggle to get that back to the pits. Uh, I think you're right there. That's uh, most unfortunate for that team. And uh, you know, it's been another difficult day for BMW Team RLL because the cars have been fast. They, were, they had troubles yesterday, failing post-qualifying scrutiny, and the cars were too low on the front, put to the back. And I spoke to the technical director there this morning. He said, look, we left a, we left a three millimeter margin for error, if you like, before the cars went out for qualifying. And for some unknown reason, the car dropped a total of five millimeters, wow, which is very lot. unusual. Yeah, it is a lot, a lot. In, this, in this business. These days, five miles is very much when you look at it, but uh, it is in this business. And uh, that's why the cars failed tech and they've been really struggling with their tires as they were at Limebrook a couple of weeks ago. But uh, somebody who's not struggling right now and taking full advantage of a fresh set of Michelin tires is Oliver Jarvis, who's just had a new fastest lap of the race with a 51.1. Just put that into perspective, the old uh, lap record around here for races was a 52.8 last season. We saw a team in full practice one do a complete brake change at the start of it. That was the 67.4 GT, and that took us by surprise because we don't normally see that sort of thing going on during a sprint race. Well, there are new brakes and rotors and pads up on the wall for the number 24 BMW. Looks like it's some sort of brake issue for John Edwards. What if he's thrown a pad? Can't happen. It's unusual and you would change the whole lot to put a match set on, and that's why he's driving around slowly. Uh, leader in GT Daytona comes to the pits, Brian Sellers. Now, this is interesting, 55 minutes as he comes in. Can he do 
54, 53 minutes to yeah, the end. I, think I reckon so. he can. I, in fact, last time around, we saw number 76 uh, Compass McLaren uh, come on to the pit lane and the number 74 Lone Star Racing Mercedes. So, yeah, I think they can do you know, just about an hour, uh, and that's what uh, they were required. It was 57 minutes to go when the number 76 car came in one lap ago. I'll watch the GTD leader. Let's go back down to Shea Adam. A very, very cautious entry to the pit box by the 24 BMW Shea. That looks like a right from brake failure to me because the uh, line is not attached and fluid was pouring out as John Edwards stopped the car in the pit lane. He didn't actually apply the brakes. He just sort of coasted into the box. But now there's a lot of brake fluid on the pit lane. So yeah, that's a, a more serious issue for the 24 BMW. That would be a shame two years in a row they would have not finished this race. Meantime, it's been full service for the 48. Still waiting for the fuel to go in. It's down. The fuel's out and it's now rolling down the pit lane. Well, BMW can't buy any look at the moment. The bonnets come off that car as well. So going through to the lead of GTD for the moment, Matt Campbell has the rest of the top 10 have all just pitted or just left the pits in GTD. So Matt Campbell, the only car still out there, as Brian Sellers yeah. did in the 48. He'll take it to the end in the next 54 minutes. Yeah, and he, he had an unscheduled stop uh, only, what, 10 laps after his first stop, number 91 car. So I think that's still going to have to make another pit stop before the end of the race. Yeah, that's the 91. That's yes. the Dennis Olsen car. Yeah, don't forget they had a drive through. Um, yeah, that's what it was, isn't it? Yeah, right, right, right. For the contact, Olsen on cat leg. So Matt Campbell, the leader of GTT for Faf Porsche, the only car that's not yet stopped for what we believe will be its final pit stop. There are people who have done, are going to have done this on just two pit stops. In fact, most of the GTD field would have done it on just two pit stops. Right. Uh, let's go back to the front of the field. Harry Tinknell is it sorting itself out again. About 20 minutes to the last pit stops there, or if you prefer, sorry, about 20 laps, I should say. Harry Tinknell by 5.6 seconds, but it's very close for second now as Ollie Jarvis has closed up on Dane Cameron. So the Mazdas beginning to find their pace again and looking for three in a row. It was seven years ago before this season. That's how far you had to go back to this track seven years ago for Mazda's last prototype win in IMSA competition. They've had two wins in the last two prototype races, which were only seven days apart. And the 77 leads at the moment. Uh, excuse me, the 55 leads at the moment with the 77 trying to get into second. GTLM leader in the pit lane First as well. First and second, Jeremy. Both the Fords yep. pitting together as they did last time around. Shea Adam is there. 67 is going to hit its marks first, and the fuel probe goes attached. Richard Westbrook staying behind the wheel of that. They are changing all four tires. It's a staggered stop for that car as Joey Hand arrives in the number 66 Ford, lining himself up very well to make a clean getaway in case he needs to if the 67 is still stationary in its box. It shouldn't be, but just in case, Joey has given himself a beautiful exit. Waiting on fuel for the 67 Ford. That's it. They want to make sure they get every last drop, though. Richard Westbrook, one of the best in the biz when it comes to making fuel, and he'll just want a little bit of extra help and reassurance. Fuel probe is out for the 67. Joey takes the taillight, his foot off the brake for the number 66. The taillights get a little bit dimmer, seeing his teammate leave. He wants to go, he wants to go now, and now he can. And where do they cycle back into the mix? Oh, they're going to be right in a GTT battle. Meantime, Matt Campbell stopped from the lead of GTD and got out right in front of Brian Seller. So a cracking in and out lap for, or first part of the out lap for Matt Campbell. And he has taken the lead in GTD, but yeah. only by a couple of feet. Remember those two cars were nose to tail before Sellers came in uh, just a couple of laps ago. And now uh, the uh, number nine car was able to stay out there, run a couple of quick laps. Yeah. And a good service by that fast team. He's got him out just ahead of Sellers. That's exactly what that team was hoping for. Brian Sellers not giving it up, though, as the wheel and Cadillac goes through between them. That's Felipe Nazar in fourth position, the best of the rest at the moment.
55 leads, six seconds. Mazda from Acura. But the battle is behind that Acura where the Oli Jarvis driven number 77 is right there. GTD coming to the final corner on the lap before you head up the hill. Matt Campbell as the BMW number 25 behind them heads for the pit lane. Now that car is was sitting in fourth position. Tonio Garcia cycled to the front of the GTLM category. My goodness, there's so much going on at the moment. Yeah. But remember, they're not all in the same strategy in GTLM. The leaders, in the meantime, carved their way past the 38 of James French, who's off the road again, this time at turn seven. Fuel, tyres and... And uh, Conor de Filippi getting into the 25 BMW. Tom Blomqvist finally gives up the BMW with just 46, uh, 49 minutes to go. Now down at turn board, this great battle in GT Le Mans between the two Fords has got the 67 car, the red, white and blue car. Just in behind the 76, that's Paul Holton back behind the wheel of the McLaren. He's sitting sixth in GTD. That McLaren is really quick in a straight line. It's not bad through the corners either. As the 67 is Richard Westbrook trying to gain some time. Conor de Filippi has just left the pit lane, remember? And it's the BMW just up the road. Now he's got to pick his way past Mario Farmback, a Super Mario. It's right in behind there with the uh, 67 Porsche, a uh, 67 Ford, which is of course the blue and orange car. Got the Acura coming through there as well. While that's going on, uh, let's go down the pit lane. Zachary Robichon is with Shea Adam. Well, race one of the last time out, leading the race as time is winding down. How hard is Matt Campbell going to have to fight to keep Brian Sellers behind him? Because you have that sprint championship to think about. Yeah, I think, you know, Matt had a really great first stint, and the guys just did a fantastic pit stop. So I think uh, we're in a good position now. We know it's, it's not easy to pass, so hopefully we can keep him behind us. Are you guys thinking that maybe if this goes yellow, you'll bring him in for a fresh set of tires? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I don't think so right now, though. Well, good luck the rest of the way. Hopefully, uh, you get a little bit more excited this time if you do come home with the win. Yeah, hopefully. We'll see what happens. Yeah, the GGD cars, they're good to go to the end from here. So uh, that, that pit stop and the, the great uh, in-lap and out-lap uh, could well be the decisive move in this race in GTD. However, I'll tell you now, Brian Sellers, with a sniff of a win there, um, will not give this one up. He'll be going into planning and stalking and scheming mode right now. He was hunted before, he is hunting at the moment. And he's right on the back of Campbell again here. It's great to see where these cars have their strengths around the circuit as they go through turn eight at the moment and into the long right-hander of the carousel, leaning on that right on that left front tyre. Porsche drifting just a little bit wide. And as the Porsche burns off its fuel, fuel tank right up front in the Porsche, then there's less weight on the front. And bizarrely, that's bad for the handling because the front end of the car gets lighter and lighter and that left front starts to scrub across the track. And Brian will know this and he'll be thinking, yeah, I wonder if I can steer this close to him until the last 10 laps of the race. See if I can put a bit of pressure on him, see if I can get him to burn that left front tyre up. Yeah. Brian did Porsche's drive always Porsche. always to go pretty well here, though, don't they? They, they so. do, in fairness, and, and Brian, uh, Brian knows the strengths and the weaknesses of Porsches. He drove one for six or seven seasons, let's not uh, forget. It's an extraordinary thing how the balance of a, a Porsche 911 changes, even on a street car, I can testify to that. As soon as you get down to about half fuel load on the front, you do feel the difference. It's actually 
under normal driving conditions when you're touring, it's not so bad. But as soon as it uh, gets into slippery conditions or you're pushing a little bit harder, you do feel it. And other than Dario Franchitti said to me, when it's raining, don't let your tank get down below half, kid. He says, oh, OK, right, oh, Dario, I'll, I will, you're right. And he was right, of course he was, because he knows such things. 45 minutes to go, Jeremy, let's take a Cadillac in-race update. We'll start with GTD, where it is Matt Campbell that leads by just under a second. Porsche number nine from Huracan, number 48. Then it's 14 seconds back to Jack Hawksworth, who's got about a second and a half on Bill Oberlin, Bill Power. Looking at the tie, Scott Pruitt's win record in IMSA in the 96 BMW. 21 seconds further back, the Acura number 86 of Mario Farnbacher, and then Paul Holton in the McLaren. Having a good run, that 76 car. It's another two seconds further back. And GT Le Mans, strategies all over the place yeah. at the moment. Tony Garcia leads by 46 seconds, but has to make another pit stop. Yeah, which I don't think is quite enough to make that pit stop and come out in the lead. No, I agree with that, Jeremy. It takes about 39 seconds to get down the pit lane, and uh, yeah, he doesn't need a full tank of fuel because he's on a, a slightly different strategy. He's going uh, for a three-stopper in that number three car. When did he last stop? He last stopped on lap 34. Right, he's getting towards the end. That it's up on that on that 12 and on that 34. So yeah, it won't be long before that car is. Uh, yeah, is he's on bound. 54 at the moment. He's he's just completed lap number 54 as he goes past us now. He'll he'll want to squeeze another lap or two out if he can and get somewhere near or under 40 minutes uh, to go to make sure he's got enough in the tank. He's doing two-minute laps, so that's about 40 minutes. You don't want to be a lap short here with that one-mile run uphill at the end. Westbrook is that 40 seconds behind for Ford GT. He's got a stop to make as well. Last pit Which stop, one? Uh, Westbrook 67. No, 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 they're, they're done. Yeah, they're, they're good, they're good. I think the only car that's got to stop is number three car. Do you think he can go 45 minutes? Who? GTLM? Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. All right. I think so. Uh, Tom Milner is the next one up. He stopped, stopped on lap 47. That's going to be tight. The, 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 the Ford team, they were planning to stop on lap 25 and lap 50. That was, that was their, 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 their schedule coming in. They did, did, did indeed stop on lap 25 for the first stop. The second stop actually was on lap 51. Yeah. So they did a little, little bit right. better. So they're, they're, uh, they're right where they wanted to be. LMP2, Matt McMurray, by 28 and a half seconds from James French, who's visited the country times, countryside at least a couple of times that I've seen, 52 from 38. DPI, Tinknell, by four and a half seconds now from Dane Cameron, after they were much closer than that. Tinknell's got his head back down after that wee mistake when he was lapping uh, Paul Hulton's car, wasn't it, in the Compass uh, McLaren, and in third position, Ollie Jarvis is still there, yeah. still hassling, still trying to put a bit of a hex on Dame Cameron, just a nine-tenths of a second. He's been seven, eight, nine-tenths behind for the last ten laps yeah, or so. Yeah, he has. He's been chasing him really, really hard, and uh, uh, and doing so, he set the fastest lap of the race, what, uh, eight laps ago on lap 52 did Oliver Jarvis in that kind of a 77. It was a good stint by Tristan Nunez, and now uh, Jarvis is in for the finish, and he wants to try and find a way past and make it a, a third Mazda, one, two in a row, but they've certainly had to work really, really hard uh, for where they are right now. The gap between the first two, the Nick Tickle, and as, uh, as Jarvis there goes, hold up uh, by the uh, LMP2 leader, that's Matt McMurray aboard car number 52. Cost him a little bit of time there in number 77, so Jarvis has got to make that up again, but Cameron... Uh, is uh, trailing Harry Tinkler by about four and a half seconds last time around. It's your Cadillac in race update. Cadillac V Series, because real races don't take days off. 41 minutes to go then, Jeremy. Tinknell. Now, what we can say is Tinknell having stopped uh, on lap 49, 48, end of lap 48. He will have one more stop to go. The question is, when does he take it? Garcia's got 48 seconds now over the number 67 car. That's Can good. Stretch that needle a little bit. He has, just a wee bit. However, 
It looks like more than routine service when that car comes in. She Adam is down at the Corvette Racing number three pit. And, well, Antonio Garcia will be getting out and Jan Magnussen getting back in. But on the wall, they have two different sized belts, as if for an alternator, and two spare batteries that they both just, they made sure that both of them were fully charged just now. I do not like the look of that. Well, the, from I think I'm right in saying that the alternator is still driven from a pulley at the back of the car. Um, been a, used to have problems with that, and they, they fixed that some time ago. And that wouldn't be the first time that we've seen that happen. And of course, it, if the alternator isn't charging, then the battery will go flat and it won't be able to start the car, and it has to start under its own volition. So that's why you put the new battery in and the new, if they've lost the belt, obviously that has to be replaced as well, otherwise it'll be the same next time around. Let's see what happens when they come in. Porsche. Porsche have just not shown today. They've been on different strategies. The very early stop by Tandy hasn't paid off. He'll be due in again shortly, I reckon. He last in. Oh no, he was only in at uh, 52. He sneaked in and out, so he's balanced that back up again. That's interesting, because he came in super early. Who did? Tandy was the first one in, and he's made the first stop, stop yeah. a couple of times, but he's just been in on lap 52. So That's right. 51. He came in the same lap as the as the two Fords. So what they basically did was they shortened things up, and then they've come in at the first option to go all the way yeah. to the end. It's really worked for them. Right. They're still 36 seconds behind Conor de Filippi's BMW. The 24 BMW, of course, with the problems of brakes, which that car was dropping away with brake issues. And uh, dropped with a brake change on that car in the pit lane. Poor John Edwards did a good job to get that car back into pit lane and into its pit stall. So Garcia due shortly, that will mean that the 67 Ford, which is the blue and orange, red striped car, will lead by some six seconds. Fastest lap of its race for Joey Hand and the 66 red, white and blue Ford. They realise they've got a good chance here. And he's only 1.6 seconds behind Richard Westbrook, and Tom Miller is turning up the wick just a little bit, possibly trying to make the Ford of Westbrook burn a little more fuel. Nice to see, by the way, earlier on that the man at the head of at GM, Jim Campbell. He's on their box. What an enthusiast that man is. The new Corvette Stingray here as well, the 2022 mid-engine V8 car. Had a good crawl over that on Friday night. It was the Target top version. Very pretty tan interior on a bronze-coloured car. The waiting list building steadily for the new vets. This battle for third place now, uh, for second place now, second and third, I suppose. Cameron and Jarvis in behind the JDC Miller Motorsport bright yellow prototype at the carousel under the Speedville Bridge. And Dave Cameron has Ollie Jarvis looming large in his rear view mirrors, which are perched up high just behind the front wheel arches, the fenders on that Acura prototype. Jarvis is coming. Jarvis has got a decent run here. Not quite close enough. Not sure that the Cadillac ahead is helping, though, as Cameron didn't get out of Canada corner as cleanly as he might have wanted to. But my goodness me, that Acura squirts away after the Bill Mitchell corner. Now coming up the hill. 
Mazda's got a little bit of an aerodynamic drag here in the draft. Passes us and crosses the line now. Oh, this is going to be tight. Jarvis dragging closer and closer. But the Acura just being held by that Cadillac ahead. That's yeah. getting a bit of an aerodynamic tour as well. This is not daft driving by Dan Cameron. He's not trying too hard to get past right. the... JDC car ahead of him, Jeremy. I think he's probably saving a bit of fuel and he's getting a bit of a draft down the straight. Yep. And it's not that slow through the corners either, so he's not really being held up. That's exactly right. Doing a really good job. Cameron's really matured, hasn't he, in the last well, couple of years. And, yeah, I mean, he's always I been know, quick. Yeah, no, that. he's always been very special, that, yeah. uh, that young man. I just like the way he attacks the race, and I say that advisedly. He knows when to attack a race, and he knows when to, to lay back. He's clearly got a very good racing brain. And picked up by Penske. Now moves up alongside the number three Corvette of Tony Garcia, which is the leader in GT Le Mans. Just trying to get that between himself and Oli Jarvis. Doesn't quite work for him, and Jarvis closes up in the carousel. But the Acura has quite a lot of grip there. Now down to the kink. Doesn't want to get too close, maybe, to that JDC car, but he's right under the rear wing now. He'll be looking to pass down into Canada corner. The BMW number 24, still with brake problems, locks up the right front, but stayed out of the way. This is interesting. Are these two losing time to our leader? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're losing, uh, well, a good second uh, a lap, actually. The gap was... Pretty stable for three to four seconds, all the balloon to, to double that. Now, the JDC car's in the pit lane, and Oli Jarvis is as close as he has been, closer perhaps, barely a car's length as they go across the line. He's under the rear wing now, he'll have to pick a side, goes to drive his left, that's the long way around, but doesn't get anywhere near the overlap in the turn one. The star works. Number eight right ahead of them. That's not a factor as they go down the hill, the Audi. Has a good look at them as they go past into turn three. And here's the GTLM leader into the pits now. By the way, that's number eight Audi with Ryan DL in 12th position in the GT Daytona category. Let's go to Shea Adam, who's got Antonio Garcia for what will be his last pit stop. Half an hour to go. This will be a time stop on the fuel, Shea. No, it won't, because they're going to be doing more significant service than that. They open the passenger door, take out both batteries that sit in that compartment of the car. They've got two new ones that will be going in. The belts on the wall are if they need to fix it in the back. The 54, by the way, is off on the track. That is Colin Brown. But we're going to keep watch on this pit stop to see if they do have to do work. They've changed all four of the tires. By the way, no driver change. They waved off Jan Magnussen and left Antonio behind the wheel. Now they are losing time with this battery change. They're having trouble getting the old ones unplugged. One comes out, two come out. One new one goes in. Waiting on the second one to go in and get plugged in. Any hopes of this car winning today, though, seemingly out the window with this alternator problem. How gut-wrenching for Jan and Antonio both. Waiting on the new battery to be plugged in. It is. The new battery's worked. And hopefully that's enough to get them to the finish. Didn't see them change the alternator belt here, so nope. they've decided that the two batteries will get them to the end. They're not planning another pit stop then. Exactly. Doesn't matter if they run those down, so long as they can't has enough to get it to the end of the race. Someone who is planning a pit stop though, John, 77 Monster Crew up on the wall. The only thing I'd say is, unless, of course, they had a look at the belt and there was nothing wrong with it. They did not. Right, they did okay. not look at the belt. They just went straight for the battery change. Oh. In comes the number 77 Mazda and the number six. I'll watch them, John. Yeah, Colin Brown was helped off the road by the number four Corvette, yeah. and that's been looked at. He went round the outside into the final corner, and then, well, did he cut across the nose of the number four of Tom Milner? That's the third place car. Not sure that's going to be a tough one for the judges of fact behind us to look at. As Second we go back to Shea Adam for Oli Jarvis's pit stop. Fuel and new tires for both the 77 Oli Jarvis behind the wheel of that and Dane Cameron in the number six Acura Team Petsky car. The Mazda should get rolling first, and indeed it does. Now, how long is it going to take for Dane to get back up to speed? Oli was stationary for 32 seconds, and Dane Cameron leads ahead. 
and he's going to have a handy lead. So as you were coming in as well behind those two, Philippe and Nasser, the best of the Cadillacs in fourth position. That'll be his last stop with half an hour to go. So Harry Tinknell did have a 23 second lead. It'll be much more than that. So Harry came in last on lap 66. So he'll be in for his last pit stop anytime soon. 77 at the moment, Oli Jarvis has a problem and it's nothing to do with the Acura, much more to do with the JDC Miller car, which is right up his aerofoil and trying to go around the outside. That is the number 84 of Stephen and, and, Simpson and that's in just up made to speed. The, yeah, just made the pit. Oh, there's a touch. Simpson up the inside. Very forceful there. Yeah, taking Squeezes the advantage of his, his first tyres. Through. Yeah, absolutely. 77 car should have, the smart thing to do to let him go. I mean, he's just come out of the pit lane on a uh, on cold tyres. Simpson's not on the same lap though, Jeremy. No, he's not. But he's trying to get back onto the lead lap. Cars 4 and 54 came together. No action at the turn 14 incident we saw a moment or two ago. Shea Adam has Harry Tignall in the pit lane. And Harry Tignall comes into the pit lane fuel and four new tires going on that car. As yes, there's no problem with that stop. I was a little concerned that there were two mechanics looking into the left rear of that car, but they were just making sure that the wheel was seated properly, waiting on fuel only. And a moment ago, we almost had a Taylor family drama as the seven was coming into its pit box, the Acura, and the 10 Cadillac was leaving. The two boys missed each other by Inches. That could have been a tough Sunday evening meal, couldn't it? Now, Tinknell leads it. When he came into the pit lane, he's rolling, he's out, and there's no sign of the Acura. He crests the hill now, and Tinknell's back out. He's done his last pit stop without even giving up the lead. Exceptional piece of work by the Master Team Yorks guys. They had the advantage, they've increased the advantage. And Harry Tignall now, with 28 minutes to go, is out in the lead. Now, Stephen Simpson down the inside at turn number six. Big lock up from both of the cars. He was right alongside him. I mean, yeah. you know. At some stage, everybody's got to turn yeah. in and you've got to give each other room. Yeah. Not sure how the bots behind us see that one, if I'm honest. I think they'll call that as a racing incident. They certainly did with the 4 and 54. So brilliant stuff from Master Team Joost to turn around Harry Tinknell, who will give you the new gap when he comes round. Oh, more issues for the 73 car. It's lost the front balance again. Now, this car has been riding high in the Sprint Cup standings for the short races in IMSA this year for GTD. And clearly the tape solution hasn't worked. So that car will have to come back in the pit again. Patrick Long was driving that car 15th in its class and dives into the pit lane. Very long pit lane, gives the team a chance to get some more tape ready or to, well, he's, he's got the splitter on. What he doesn't have is the bumper and the front valance. And they might just send him without that. So, not sure that it does anything aerodynamically. Shea Adam is watching this. The last time they came in, John, Ipsa told them that they had to have all of those bits and pieces on. They were worried about him running around Road America without a splitter. And the splitter is held on with these thin little cords that are hidden beneath the bumper. As the bumper falls back down into place, they're going to need a lot of tape to get this one to stick, though. Not part places day. No, not at all. I'm not sure that's... Is that the right splitter? Doesn't look like it's... Or the right valance. It doesn't look good. Yeah, but maybe he's had a bit more contact there. They're filling the car. 25 minutes to go. This is just about getting points for the Sprint Championship. Last round of the Sprint Championship, by the way, is at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Sega. And that, for those of you here in the States, will be live flag to flag on NBCSN. First three hours of Motul Petit Le Mans on the network as well. That's all good news. Pretty lengthy battle, number 76, 
McLaren after a long last pit stop or losing time during that pit stop sequence at least because it was running in third place has just snuck, found a way past the GTD championship leader kind of 86 that's the fifth position Harry Tinknell leading then 4.9 seconds Ollie Jarvis 77 in third between them, Dean Cameron. Oliver Jarvis was getting pretty frustrated. He still can't find a way past uh, Stephen Simpson. Now he's completely up to speed. He didn't want to lose that uh, lose that ground at all, but he, he did do. And uh, now he's falling uh, a long way behind Dane Cameron, who's just set that car's fastest lap of the race at one minute 51.5 for the second place car of Dane Cameron last time around. He trails the leader by 3.9 seconds. 69 laps in the books, 24 minutes remaining. Battling GTLM uh, is far from settled as well. Number 20, uh, 67 car leads again, really, really good strategy and driving from uh, from that team. But number four and number 66 battling over second place and less than three seconds behind them. Yeah. Well, this has been a well-judged race again by Master Team Yost and the Multimatic organisation. Huge changes to this car over the last couple of three seasons. And it's really come alive. Some big engine upgrades on that virtuous triangle I was talking about earlier. You want reliability, you want good power, but you want good fuel mileage as well. And managed to be delivered. Acura have not given this up, though. Dean Cameron will never say die. He's just put his fastest lap of the race in, 151.5. Closes down to within four seconds. Yeah, and uh, that on board here with Oliver Jarvis in third position, that car ahead of him, the Cadillac. That is car number 84 of Stephen Simpson. And it is a lap down to the leaders, but uh, including Oliver Jarvis. And the uh, time is slipping away. 6.4 seconds now, the gap between second and third. Meanwhile, there's a quick laps by Dane Cameron. Another quick good one last time around, a 52.5 again, 52.5 against the 51.5 he turned on the previous lap. But he's still uh, just... Uh, running at a very, very good pace at the moment, and he is only three seconds out of, away from the leader. Seven car leads in GTLM. GTLM cars have completed now 60 five laps three seconds once again that gap between first and second that should stretch just a couple of tenths of a second on that last lap the uh, Ford team running exactly as they as they had hoped during this race it's they do all their simulations beforehand they know when they they are planning to make their pit stops how much fuel they're going to take on board whether they're going to take on fresh tires or not and uh, They've uh, run this strategy absolutely perfectly. The BMWs, they've been fast. Of number 24 car had a problem. Number 25 car, though, that was uh, running into tire roofs again. Got, let's not forget, the uh, unlike the other categories, the GTLM teams, they have three Michelin, different Michelin slick tires to choose from in terms of construction and or compound, uh, i.e. some of them are a little bit quicker, a bit softer, a bit faster, but they will degrade a little bit more. And so it's up to the teams to make the right selection. And for the last two races, the BMW team, they've certainly been struggling in the latter stages of each of their stints. And that's showing again, I think, here with the number 25 car that's running now in the fifth position in GTLM. Yeah, and it's up to the team to try and maximise that performance, of course, uh, Jeremy. So you're, you're absolutely right to point, to point that out. And, of course, we should say as well that uh, when that's... When John Edwards' car was slowing down. 
uh, it did have a brake problem and had to come in for a brake change. Yeah. So that was uh, yeah. adversely affe affecting it as well. I think that was a brake problem that was getting worse. He was actually leaking fluid, which of course we didn't know that at the time, and probably neither did the team until uh, they brought him in and realised that they were going to have to do a brake change and br brought him back in again. So Mazda lead it from Dean Cameron, who is closing in gradually. Cameron doing a cracking job in closing down Harry Tinknell at the moment. This one is far from over with still 20 minutes to go. We've seen brilliant finishes here at Road America down over the years. I'm just going to throw this in, you know, just for... A bit of a laugh as the 73 car, by the way, the park place Porsche back behind the wall again with that uh, issue at the front caused by the contact with Catherine Legg when Catherine was turned around by Dennis Olsen. I'm just going to throw this in. Uh, the weather's closing in again. We saw this yesterday and from exactly the same part of the circuit over by... Canada corner and out towards the carousel there are dark and threatening rain clouds and it's getting cooler the wind is just starting to pick up a bit it's very still quite still out there but uh, there's rain coming I'm looking at the rain coming towards us now I think we're about going to get away with it with 18 and a half minutes to go meteorologists Meteorologist Heinhoff has the uh, definitive word on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's my fault if we don't. Clearly <laughs> that. Yes. Mm. I think uh, there's our race leader. He's running nice, consistent laps in the 52s uh, and uh, 52s and 53s. That's one minute 52, one minute 53. Nice, consistent, but very fast pace. Remember, the old lap record was a 52.8. Uh, and he's averaging that at least is Harry Ticknell out in front of this race. He's got about a four second advantage now over the second place car of Dane Cameron. That gap has stabilized over the last several laps, but number 77 car, I think he's managed to find a way finally past Stephen Simpson and is pulling away pretty rapidly. And he's certainly reducing that gap to the second place car. Well, we've got bad news for Nissan fans, according to the Twitter feed. Core Autosport are out of the race. Shears tried to track someone down. They're off the pit board pretty early as well. They had uh, contact that pushed Conan Brown off the road. It was with the number four Corvette, wasn't it, at the final corner? We've got another incident under review, and that's the third place Jack Hawksworth, number 14, Lexworth. <laughs> Lexworth? <laughs> Jack Hawks is in the Lexworth uh, and the number 96, Bill Oberlin. They've been battling for position number three in GT Daytona. Uh, so we'll see which way that one plays out. Clearly been battling a little too, too hard. At least it's being looked at at the moment. Porsche still leads Matty Campbell in the GT Daytona category with Brian Sellers 2.7 seconds behind. There's another good battle going on a bit further down the field with Andy Lally and Dennis Olsen. Lally in the 44 Lamborghini yeah. in that satin blue and black Magnus car and then the mainly white and orange Porsche number 91. Dennis Olsen already having served the penalty for causing an incident when he put the hip check on Catherine Legg's NSX, which then ironically turned Catherine around and caused the damage to the 73 car. Yeah, this battle has been going on quite a while now <laughs> between these two. It's for position, is it? It's for uh, ninth and tenth places. But, you know, it's this points. category is so close, not, an, an, not too far ahead of them at all. Number 12 and 63, which aren't uh, too far apart. And, and actually not too far ahead of them. Also, so the 86 car, the championship leader, in sixth. Yeah, that's sixth all the way down to 10th position, all within sight of each other.
watching also Tommy Milner trying to close down on the Richard Westbrook driven Ford Ford looking very strong here again they got the tactics absolutely right the Chip Ganassi team going a different way to everybody else at Lime Rock Park and they took the win at the end of the race they've hit the front earlier and Tommy Milner trying to keep them honest there he's been pushed along by Joey Hand the second car the second Ford car as they battle for second and third the 4 and 66 Harry Tinknell, all of a sudden, six seconds is the gap, and the guys on the wall will be feeling a little better about that. But as the IMSA radio saying goes, traffic giveth, traffic taketh away. He's in behind the second place, GTD. Goes through past the Lamborghini, now he's got the 912 of Earl Bamba. Bamba only in fourth position here and with both the Fords ahead of the best of the Porsches that'll keep the manufacturer's title running to at least the next race not been a good weekend for Porsche this weekend yeah. they've been saying all weekend that they don't have the horsepower to compete here <laughs> Shea Adams been down to core retirement we hear what's the conclusion after Colin brought that car in the pits after that incident. Many thanks to Jeff Brown. Gearbox is the issue. Uh, that's the second time they've had uh, driveline troubles. Didn't that take them out at Watkins Glen as well? Uh, you are correct. Yeah. Thank you, Shea. Good hustle from Shea down there, finding that out to us. So gearbox issue. Right, Jeremy, 13 minutes to go. Car number 14, which is the Lexus of Jack Hawksworth. Incident responsibility with 96. Warning. Yeah, that's a, the ongoing battle Oof. here for third place in GTD. Can't afford anything else, though, Jeremy. Bill Oberlin will have got that word, so he'll be pushing as hard as he can to try and make Jack Hawksworth jump. Hawksworth at the moment running down towards turn number five. Uh, and in fact, the BMW is ahead. The BMW has got ahead of Hawksworth. Dragged through last lap by, went round the outside into turn five. There was a little bit of touch and bump there. Well, was that what he got the... Yeah. That's earlier on. There was a little bit of a touch and bump at turn five which is what the warning came from. But Oberlin's already through, so that must have happened this lap, because when they went across the line, Hawksworth was just ahead by two tenths of a second. So Oberlin has taken the advantage of effectively having a yellow card. And through he has gone into third position. Meanwhile, further down, the other Lexus embroiled in a bit of a battle as well. Wow. 63, he's just gone by. Tony Villander's just gone past Townsend Bell, and now Boots. he's about to get mugged by another couple of cars as well, including yep. Andy Lally and Dennis Olsen. Townsend Bell, then, who started this lap in seventh position, is at least now down in ninth as Lally goes through and pulls away in the Magnus Lamborghini, and Dennis Olsen's not backwards and coming forwards. So he'll be having a little go as well. And look, all of a sudden, the, the, there's not too much between the race leaders at uh, the front no. of the field in, in prototype. All of a sudden, Harry Tink was only a couple of seconds oh. ahead of number six. Also, oh, another that? mistake from him and the kick, but somehow he holds <laughs> on there. Wow. Feet off, don't touch anything, for goodness sake, don't break. What have we got his attention? Well, I tell you what, Olsen unusually ragged today for the Porsche young professional and that will have been noted as well uh, just to mention Jeremy by the way 
Yeah, Olsen wasn't anywhere close. I think he got a bit of aero push there behind the Lexus. Car just didn't seem to turn in. Uh, worth notice, noticing that when Harry Tinknell comes through this time around, which he will do any second now, he will go onto lap. He will have completed lap number 76 and go on to lap number 77. Why is that important? Because the race distance record for a two hour 40 minute race here is 76 laps. So we're about to complete the 76 lap. Hello. No, we've completed 76. Th sorry? We've completed 77, 77 now. Right, yep. 77 yep. now. Right, okay, so that's a new distance record. 4.2 seconds. Uh, 33 is back in the pit lane. Has that car been circulating all this time off the front page? Uh, yes, it has. No, it hasn't. Fuel stop only for that car, so that's going to be picking up a few points. Now, what happened at turn six? Ah, Townsend Bell had uh, prototype up the inside and Tony Vlander thought, well, if he's going to make a room for him there, I'm going to put my car in it. And he did. Nice piece of opportunist work by Vlander in the Ferrari. And hello to all the 600 WeatherTech employees who are here this weekend, local company, celebrating 30 years in the area and 30 years of excellence. Hope you're enjoying the day. Nice move by Vlander, who's now up to seventh position in GTD. No difference really between the cars at the front of the field, Jeremy, they're matching each other 10th for 10th, depending on what happens in the traffic. Tinknell, a couple of seconds quicker that time around because Cameron hit the traffic that Harry did a lap and a half ago when the gap went down to just under five seconds to just under three. So GT Daytona led by Matt Campbell. Sellers has hung on there. 2.7 seconds. And don't forget, if you're here in the US, We'll round off the Sprint Cup part of the GTD season at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Sega, which is on the NBC network. I think I said NBCSN earlier on, for which I apologise. That is flag to flag. If you're in the US, further afield, of course, you'll still be able to watch on IMSA.TV and every single session of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, guaranteed from all IMSA weekends live on IMSA Radio. Still plenty of action to come from the GTTs as well as we go to the Michelin GT Challenge at VIR. That's our next race. No prototypes there. And on a circuit that always provides action, much as here, always great to go back to Virginia with the GT cars. Ford versus Corvette out on the circuit. It's the battle for second in GT Le Mans, down to turn number five. And that was a relatively easy pass by Joey Hand. Nothing. It's taken him a to, while to find a way past that. Yeah, and, and it was interesting there, Tommy, I think, realised, Tommy Milner, who's driving the Ford Corvette, that he didn't have much left. Six minutes to go, they're going to take the points they can get. Antonio Garcia still well back, 42 seconds off the leader. That was the better place of the two Corvettes at the moment. Ford 1 and 2, and the manufacturer battle in GTLM goes on to that Michelin GT event at VIR. GT only event at VIR. A couple of weeks' time. Weather getting ever more threatening, but with only six, five minutes to go, five and a half minutes to go now. You'd risk it, wouldn't you? Whatever happens, even if there's a cloudburst on the far side of the circuit, you're not going to give up a good position. If you're sitting in sixth or seventh, still on the lead lap, you might dive in for a set of Michelin wets. 
Shea Adams in the pit lane. Uh, it's easy for me to say that, Shea, because I'm sitting in the air-conditioned luxury of the uh, IMSA Broadcast Centre. <laughs> but, but it's not that easy for those on the pit lane. Number four Corvette is in the pits. Oh, really? With five minutes remaining in the race. Oh, yeah, wow. they got their it's a bad day for wrong. Corvette, then. Well, I was just going to say, there's a lot of nervous faces up and down the pit lane, not necessarily because of the weather, but because even if you're sure that you have your fuel numbers right, it's a long climb up that hill well, to see the checkered flag. You say that, they came in on lap 46 in that Corvette, and that was significantly earlier than anybody else. Well, and, and the first stop was on lap 21, too, so yeah. it was always going to be a struggle for them. They needed some yellow with the strategy they had been pursuing, and they didn't get it. Well, that's going to push Porsche up to third position. Yeah. It's It'll fuel only for Milner. Timed fuel stop only for Milner. So, yep, yeah, there's a certain sense of resignation down there at Corvette Racing. So they could make it on lap 47. Who's the next closest on fuel? 52. I think, the, I think everybody else should be OK. Right. Because uh, that number four car came in, well, the number... Yeah, number 24 is out of sequence. Number 12, 9, 12 came in four laps later. Yeah, 50. Yeah, we should we should be, uh, we've only got four minutes remaining, so only a couple of laps, oh no, a problem from McLaren. I think that's out of fuel, Jeremy. Yeah. 76 car, this is fifth, Paul Holton. Oh, wow. Is he well, cr he's crawling up he, the hill. He was in the pits on, only one lap before oh, on. the majority of the GTD cars. No, no, I thought he had a broken rear suspension there. He's crawling in the pit lane very slowly, so he has got some motive power it's at the wrong end of the pit lane from where she is so we'll just have to have a look because he's right outside our window so fifth position for mclaren's about yeah it is it's just fuel well now this throws the cat amongst the pigeons because he was only one lap four miles better than everyone else in gtd when they all came in together in as well 74 also that came was in, in on the same, same lap. lap yes exactly and they're just getting four or five seconds of fuel. The McLaren hasn't restarted, but the Lone Star AMG has. Now, this is going to be another one of those Road America finishes that we've had it here before, where people have run out, but they can't restart the McLaren, but that was just a fuel stop. So, wow. 47. This, I right, got it going. Got it going in a big burnout. So, Matt Campbell, Brian Sellers, Hawks with Farmback, Avilander, Lally, top seven. That's Porsche, Lamborghini, BMW, Lexus, Acura, Ferrari, Lamborghini for the top seven. Six manufacturers in the top seven. Two and a half minutes to go. We're going to have drama in <laughs> GTD. It's a shocker, isn't it? Yes. Westbrook and Joey Hand now only separated by... 4.7 seconds, the two Fords. Look like, looking like a formation finish there. Porsche in third, Di Filippi in fourth for BMW, salvaging a little bit for BMW after that day hasn't gone the way they wanted it to. Tony Garcia puts his fastest sector time in, in the number three Corvette, and that's because he's trying to catch Conor Di Filippi and get some extra points. It's a battle for fourth position in GT Le Mans, but it could be crucial come the end of the season. At the head of the field, Cameron's right with Harry Tingle. Yeah. 1.7 seconds after yeah. the fastest yeah. third sector. Uh, right, and the number 77 car is only a second behind as well. This is game on at the front of the field. I tell you, I'm not sure any, everybody was expecting this to be all green. They've been burning a lot of race fuel. And all of a sudden, it's all come back together. I think the, I think the prototypes are OK. Well, here's something very fuel. interesting. Ricky Taylor is the next car ahead of, of the next prototype ahead of the race leader. Now, let's see what happens here with his teammate closing in. What was Taylor's last lap? 155. Taylor's slowing up. Taylor is going to try and back the leader into his teammate. He might not need to because he's got caught behind Bill Orbel and going into the kink. Very tight indeed, through the kick now. And here comes the Acura, Dan Cameron is in prime position here for the dodge out and the overtake down in Canada corner. Can't make that happen. Jarvis is hoping into view as well. So it's both Acuras versus both Mazdas.
but one of the Acuras is a, almost a full lap down. It'll be white flag this time around. Four miles to decide the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship here at the Road Race Showcase. Well, the last time a Mazda won here seven years ago, it was a battle to the line. The last five laps or so were absolutely extraordinary. And we've got it again. Yep, one, First, two, second and third through turn one. 55.1 last time around for the race leading Tinknell. Yeah, he was held up by the yep. BMW. Oh, yeah, that's, what's, uh, that's what closed everything up. Now, where is the other Acura? Oh, he's just up the road. I don't think he's going to come into play here. I hope he doesn't. Turn five, about a third of the way around. Oh, the leader's gone wide, goes right off the circuit and pulls across. He's hit the other car. That's going to be a penalty. Yeah. Oh, my goodness me. Now, Jarvis has chance here. Jarvis has got to jump the Acura because I'm sure they're going to look at that mistake by Harry Tinknell. Second time, Harry has dropped the wheels off the circuit today and it might cost him the race there as he defended rather too stoutly for my liking. Yep. Yep. He cut across in defence in reaction to what was going on behind. Ollie Jarvis has been blocked behind the Paul Holton McLaren. This one's not over. It's not over at all. They'll be looking at that. Contact on the last lap. The Back of the Mazda's got some damage. The front of the Acura looks all right now. They're back together again. There's cars ahead of them. Jeremy, believe it or not, turn the clock back seven years. We're going to have a drag race through the last corner. And now, I said this seven years ago, who's got the ponies? Is it Mazda or is it Acura? Last time it was Mazda, it will be Mazda again this time. And across the line, it's three in a row for Mazda. And the second race win on the year for the 55. John Doonan is reduced to tears again. Jarvis comes through in third after being held up in traffic. We're not seeing that that's being looked at at the moment, so as it stands, there's nothing to talk about. And Tignal wins by two tenths of a second. Matt McMurray takes LMP2. Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell got ahead, got through ahead of the leaders, so will actually win GTD by a whole lap which seems a little unfair on the score sheet after he was pushed so hard by Brian Sellers. Brian Sellers went a lap down to the race leader. Another lap down just as they were coming to the line. And in GT Le Mans, the manufacturer's title is not yet going the way of Stuttgart and Porsche because Ford are one too. And Andy Lally just held off Tony Vreelander at the line. He got ahead of him a, 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 a couple of laps ago, I guess, for six, six and seventh. Some great racing all the way through. Brilliant, brilliant strategy once again from Ford Chip Ganassi Racing. It's another one-two. Well, it's another one-two. It's another one-two because they've had lots of them in the past, and that's been the dominant car here at Road America. So Matt Campbell will come round on what is effectively his victory lap because the leader had gone. That was had gone past all of his competition. He'll be the last man to take the checkered flag. Three in a row and another drag race to the line. Seven years after that famous finish here. Shea Adam is down at Master Team Yours. I'm not sure we're actually going to get a cognizant sentence out of John Dune and the raw emotion. You've got three in a row and you've got a win at Road America, your home track. How amazing is this? Oh, Shea, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Oh, this Mazda race team's been amazing. These guys, Multimatic, these guys have transformed this program. And oh, I've been coming here since I was six weeks old, and uh, I wanted to be here for one so bad for so long, and I just cannot believe we got it done. It's uh, a total team effort, and what an inspiration. We got about 200 guests down in turn five, Mazda dealers, corporate partners, lots of family and friends, and we did it. I can't believe it. I hope they have the chocolate milk ready for you because that white shirt you've got on, it's about to be a little bit brown. 
Well, I got the socks on and um, got a long sleeve shirt on, the chocolate milk ones in, uh, in storage forever, but uh, I wanted one so bad here for the Mazda brand and for my family. I've been coming here with my dad since I was a little tiny kid, and uh, this is the most uh, beautiful and best racetrack in the entire world. Congratulations, John. Thanks, Shay. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Michelin post race tech to come on IMSA Radio. Let's have your comments, questions, points arising. Hashtag Michelin PRT to at IMSA Radio. Lots of stuff to talk about there, even up to the checkered flag and beyond. We've got uh, Tinknell off the track trying to pick up a little bit of uh, tyre debris to make sure there's no issues with. Uh, any post-race tech height there? Shit, Adam, where have you moved to now? Um, one garage down to Ford GT, two in a row for Ryan Briscoe and Rick Westbrook. How about that, Ryan? Yeah, awesome. I mean, just uh, what a great effort. Just flawless race for us, really. I mean, uh, we had the advantage on the long runs and uh, the windows were really tight today on strategy. You know, the three car, they were going to be looking promising had they not had the problem on the, on the three-stop strategy, but... Uh, we knew our strength was going to be on old tyres, and, and I think that's where we made the difference today. Congrats, two in a row. Thank you. Yes, he was a bit disappointed that he wasn't on the front row, which would have turned into a pole position, but his uh, fast lap discounted. He was a little wide at turn one, inch perfect today. And another win for the 67 crew. Richard Westbrook will be a happy man on the plane on the way home tonight, as will Ryan Briscoe. Mazda, a little damage on the back of that uh, 55 Mazda. I don't think in any of their victories, Shea, they've brought a car home with uh, <laughs> the rear aerodynamics. I mean, it's completely broken on the right-hand side. It's hanging off on the left-hand side. We've seen that before. At, uh, it was uh, Watkins Glen, the 55 car was damaged. I think the 77 had a bit of damage that when it won at, uh, at CTMP as well. You are correct, John. I think uh, maybe next time they'll let Bomarito finish the race and see if he can bring it home clean. <laughs> now they're they're pretty happy with Tinks. And I do have to say, uh, when I was watching the last final laps, John, one A. McNish was staring at the screens and he had told me on the grid that he had to leave early because he has a flight to catch tonight from Chicago. He did not leave early. Yeah, he'll be fine. He could have listened on the way down on, uh, on Sirius 202, of course. Should have told him that. Uh, we dodged the weather, and we've had another great finish. Shea will jump in with some more of the interviews as soon as we get them. Jeremy, inter intermediate point. Uh, what, if, what have we got? This is all unofficial, of course, and subject to post-race inspection. Uh, where do you want to start? Yeah, just on a DPI. Uh, the Dane Cameron and Juan Pablo Montoya, they will extend their championship lead with a second place finish today. They've now got a seven point edge over Felipe Nasser and, Felipe, and uh, Pipa Durrani, who finished once again in fourth position in the best of the Cadillacs. Uh, in third position now, however, jumping for up from sixth will be Jonathan Bomarito, a winner for the second time this season, along with Harry Tinknell and that he will have 222 points, as will uh, Elio Castroneves and Ricky Taylor. But the uh, Mazda team will have that position on the countback because Castroneves and Taylor have yet to win a race. Uh, manufacturers, have we done those? Manufacturers, uh, yeah, Acura will continue to lead uh, convinced, uh, over Cadillac, actually stretch their lead over Cadillac. Mazda will get a little bit closer in third place. Right. What else have you done? Uh, well, LMP2, uh, Matt McMurray came in here with a two-point lead over, uh, over Cameron Castles. He will leave with a five-point edge. And Just before you go on to yep. the next one, let's take an interview from Cher. It doesn't seem to matter who is co-driving with Zach Robichon. Somehow finds a way to victory lane. And uh, for Zach, it's, it's pretty exciting to get a win at Lime Rock Park. It's very exciting to get a win here at Road America. This nine FAF team, they had to work pretty hard today for it. Yeah, I mean, incredible draw by the team. Once again, uh, both at Lime Rock and this weekend, we were able to jump some cars in pit lane and just, you know, they did a perfect job and, and Matt executed perfectly. So uh, just, just a fantastic feeling. Congratulations, you wanted a track that has Canada Corner. That's it, yeah, it's, that's, that's, that's what it's for. <laughs> Thank you. Jeremy, continuing with the uh, results on the championship, unofficial championship standings. In GTLM, uh, Lawrence Vantour and Earl Bamba, they came in here with an eight-point edge over Patrick P uh, teammates Patrick Pilem and uh, Nick Tandy. They will extend that now to 14 points. 
Uh, up into third place, however, Richard Westbrook and Ryan mm. Briscoe with their second win in successive weekends. They will move one point ahead of Jan Magnussen and Antonio Garcia for third. And Richard Westbrook and Briscoe are now only four points behind Pile and Tandy. In the Manufacturers Championship, uh, Porsche have 269, uh, Ford have 230, no, 248. Uh, but uh, it, that pretty much all, it doesn't quite clinch it. No, it doesn't. But, well, it actually, what does it in terms of wins? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. No, they can tie them, but that's the best they can do. Right, and then it would go on count back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is that everybody done? Uh, did you do GTD? Uh, no, GTD. Yes, thank um, you. Sorry. She's kind of doing that. Uh, I mean, Mario Farnbach and Trent Hinman have a, uh, ha had a huge lead. It'll get trimmed it just a little 30, bit. It was 30, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was 30 here. points. It'll now be... Uh, a little bit less, it'd be 26 over Bill Oblin and Robbie Foley, who finished uh, again on the podium in third place. That's that to the tournament is what's the third, fourth consecutive podium finish, so, so great result for them. For FAF Motorsports, though, number 30, that's uh, number nine car, Zachary Robichon will certainly make, make up some ground in the driver's standings. And in the Sprint Cup, I haven't actually got, got down to round to that yet, but I'm thinking. Well, let me, let me figure that one out. But I think that Zachary Rubichon might now be leading right. the Sprint Cup points. I'll work on that. Final Sprint Cup, of course, Mazda Raceway, uh, WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, uh, live on NBC Network. Uh, that's in two races time. Shea, any chance of a, another quick interview from you? I'm staring at the back of this Mazda and uh, just sort of in awe that he actually managed to keep it on the road for the end of that because it was um, pretty... Pretty sketchy, I have to say. Uh, let me jump in with Jonathan Bomarito really quick, if I can, because we interviewed him in the middle of the race. But, uh, Jonathan, you got the race winner hat on once again. Race winner hat on once again. Uh, and the car's damaged once again. You guys seem to have a pattern going. Yeah, when the rear wing's about to fall off, that seems like when we're going to win. So, <laughs> no, it was amazing, amazing. Uh, Harry did an amazing job at the end. The Penske's were really quick there. And, uh, wow, what an amazing day. The whole crew, amazing job on both cars again. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of speechless. I mean, we're at Road America, Dunin's home track, all of his family. And that was a hard-fought battle the whole time. No uh, yellows, green flag. We lost AC in the car. It was just unbearable in there, and, and Harry powered through. Congrats. Thank you. Well done to Shea Adam. The party beginning down there. We'll hand the PA in 88.3 FM back to Tony Laporta for the formalities on RS2 and 454 here at the track uh, and around the world. We'll continue in just a few moments' time with Michelin Post Race Tech with a reminder that in two weeks' time, we're at the Michelin GT challenge at VIR. The prototypes take a weekend off and we celebrate everything that is grand and touring. Hope you can join us then on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Post Race Tech, Michelin Post Race Tech comes up right now. Well, it seems that I tend to start Michelin Post Race Tech with a wow every <laughs> weekend. But really, Jeremy Shaw, uh, it is once again absolutely uh, required and, uh, and absolutely correct to start with a wow. I mean, another full grain flag race, which actually pro proved really important at the end for a couple of the GTD guys who didn't quite get out for Corvette, actually, who didn't quite get their sums right or weren't able to do the fuel mileage. It was very interesting to hear people saying that they thought that the stints would be uh, tyre restricted, but in fact, they were, in some cases, uh, fuel restricted. And, I mean, four battles, the biggest gap was the 31 seconds 
in uh, LMP2. Well, that really could have gone either way. And James French managed to keep the car on the road a bit more. <laughs> and might have been even a little bit uh, closer than that. Uh, just great racing. That's all I can say. Great yeah. racing. Yeah, and you know, in, in that class, Matt McMurray extended his lead, but it was actually James that got the faster lap in the race. A little bit of bragging points there for the for the local driver from Sheboygan. Uh, it was it was a cracking motor race. I mean, all, you know, all four classes. You know, the, the the LMP2 again. There might only be two cars, but they had a good battle all the way through that race. So that was fun in itself, and it was just really interesting to see the strategies played out. You just talked about GTLM and the. The uh, Corvette team, their number four car, making a pit stop shortly before the finish. Uh, those two, the three and the four, running slightly different strategies. Number three car, that made the extra extra stop. That was kind of committed to that, uh, I think, fairly on in the proceedings, was it? I can't remember now. It stopped after 20-odd laps, the four car, didn't it? Yeah, no, number three car came in after after a dozen laps. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that that was kind of being held up by the by, by several other cars at that stage. and. Uh, it, it, it kind of came out in a wash because it still finished in fourth position, but it did finish ahead, uh, you know, comfortably ahead of the number four car. So it's actually that fourth place finish for Garcia and Magnussen is, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good result considering. Uh, but they'll certainly be disappointed having started from the pole position with one car uh, and the other car up in the top three as well. They certainly would have been looking for better than that. But Ford Chip Ganassi Racing, I think, once again executed absolutely perfectly this afternoon. Yeah, can't disagree with uh, that. Uh, what have Core got to do uh, to get some luck, says Right Turn Lover. And he says, what does Ben Keating have to do to get some luck? Second race in a row that uh, Ben Keating has had uh, rotten luck and a rotten uh, result. I, I mean, it, the racing gods sometimes, Jeremy, seem to be terribly fickle. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's got to be really disappointing for that team because they had a good run going today. They were up in the top at half a dozen. Colin Brown Great drove. Call. I mean, yeah. John Bennett did, had sold him. He did a, a good first stint. He wasn't losing much ground at all. Long lap to the here, other so guys. he managed to stay just about on the lead. No, 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 comfortably, yeah. comfortably. No, not even close. I mean, he he was running. Uh, he was running, you know, not too far behind uh, the uh, the um, JDC. Uh, the, no, he, actually, he was running right, right with number five car and the JDC cars. No, he was running just great. Mm. Re that was a really good stint from John Bennett. And, and then from there, Colin Brown you know, worked his magic. It wasn't going to be another win for that team, probably. But they were on for another. They were, they were running in, in uh, sixth place when they had the problem. I don't think they were going to.